Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the August 30th, 2010 Planning Commission meeting. At this time, I'll call the meeting to order. And ask for any public comment on any item not currently listed on our agenda this evening. Seeing none, we'll move on into our first Planning Commission hearing, uh, which is CP 1002 and WR 1005, uh, Housing Authority of Clackamas County. And this, this time we'll ask the city attorney to read our legal information for you. Sir. Chair Powell, uh, members of, of the commission. Um, let me first start by uh, noting a, uh, that uh, there was a staff report prepared seven days in advance of this that lists all the applicable criteria. If you need those identified, please let me know and we'll, we'll uh, read those to you. Uh, testimony, arguments, and evidence that you may have tonight should be directed toward those criteria in the staff report that are identified or to other land use regulations that you believe apply to the uh, to this particular project. Uh, failure to raise an issue with sufficient specificity to uh, allow the Planning Commission and the, and any other parties involved to respond to the issue will include an appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals. And uh, failure of the applicant to raise constitutional issues or other issues related to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the Planning Commission to respond to the issue will include a, an action for damages in circuit court. Um, and then I want to. Uh, for the public hearing procedure, we do have them up on uh, up on the wall. We'll start with a staff report by uh, city staff, followed by the applicant presentation, uh, which is 15 minutes. Uh, they can request additional time from the commission if they so choose. Followed by public testimony from those in support of the application. Uh, we have three minutes uh, for anyone to speak, 10 minutes for recognized neighborhood associations. Uh, public testimony from those neither in support or against, then public testimony from those in opposition, uh, questions from the Planning Commission and rebuttal from the applicant, uh, which is uh, limited to 10 minutes, and then uh, Commission delibera deliberation and action of which staff would be available to assist and answer any questions you may have. And although there are time limits on the oral presentation in, in light of uh, the people's time, you are, anybody is able to submit any link of written material for the Planning Commission to consider. Uh, with that, um, let's turn to the, the particular hearing item. The first one is the Housing Authority of Clackamas County um, for a, uh, uh, approval of an over of a concept development plan and exemption from natural resources. Are there any um, bias, ex parte, or conflict of interest issues that any of the planning commissioners uh, would like to discuss? Oh yeah, the declarations to make. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, um, I'm active in the Park Place Neighborhood Association. I'm the chair of the group and I participate on the Land Use Committee. Um, also, my spouse, Nancy Walkers, is the chairperson of that uh, uh, neighborhood association. Um, with regards to the Housing Authority, um, I've uh, volunteered hours, I think, um, in helping to put together the community garden um, and participated in uh, the uh, neighborhood meetings that the HAC has had with uh, PPNA and um, participate, participated in the community outreach, uh, the design threats, and the neighborhood meetings. So um, I'm able to um, make an objective decision without bias uh, by applying the facts and the record uh, to the criteria um, that are required for this applica application. Um, and uh, Let's see, I, and I have no uh, real or potential conflict of interest in this project at all. So I'm willing to accept any questions uh, from the planning commissioners or the community at large. A challenge to uh, Commissioner Curtis Ryan's particip participation in this matter. Seeing none, just one quick, uh, in your role in, in the Neighborhood Association, did you have any ex-party communications or discussions that touched on, on this? Um, nothing, I think, nothing that was relative to um, the records that we're looking at today, only um, relative to the community process that I think is discussed in the future or not. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other? None here. Okay. None for me either. So we can move on to that point. Yes, sir. Good evening. I'm here to present to you CPO 1002 and WR 1005, which is Natural Resource Overlay Exemption, as well as the Concept General Development Plan. I wanted to start by talking about what the Concept General Development Plan is. So, if 
it's under our master plan section of our code. So some people refer to this as a master plan, others would call it a concept plan. Our code also refers to it as a general development plan. So all of these apply. Over the here is the general impacts of a large project. So the purpose of this process is to take large projects that may be implemented over phases and figure out what is their impact, what's their maximum intensity, and how to mitigate that impact. Um, so after this approval, there'll be a series, if this gets approved, there'll be a series of detailed development plan applications, and that's really where we're looking at the specific street sections, how tall the buildings are, what the buildings look like, any land divisions, and things like that. So at this point, I just wanted to um, remind the audience that we're looking at just these master plan criteria in these larger concepts of this development. So, our site's located off Holcomb Boulevard near Apperson, Gain, and Front. You'll notice on this very colorful map, there's a lot of zoning designations nearby. Our site itself is split zoned. You can see the northern half of the site is zoned R3.5 Long District. That allows single-family attached, detached, and duplexes on lot sizes of 3,500 square feet per unit. The bottom part of the site is zoned MUC1, which is a mixed-use corridor. And adjacent to the site, you'll notice there's the bright yellow zone R6, and there's some MUC1 in a various assortment of zoning designations as well. So let's take a little bit closer look at the site itself. The site is developed with a circa 1940s housing project um, called Clackham Sites. It has 100 dwelling units currently. Um, they're in the form of duplex type buildings all on the same site. And as you can see, there's a series of streets that kind of intersect through the site that don't connect to each other at all. There's a pedestrian path system that connects between the streets and down to Steve's Market, um, but it does provide limited connectivity for both cars and pedestrians as well. Um, the southern part of the site has two dwelling units with associated accessory structures um, adjacent to Holcomb Boulevard. So the applicant has proposed to demolish all of the existing structures on site, and then they want to construct up to 800, or I'm sorry, up to 283 dwelling units. So the dwelling units would take a few different forms, so they may look like single-family detached or attached units, stacked flats. There's some with a uh, dwelling unit over four garage stalls, carriage houses, and two multifamily looking structures as well. Also, they would like to construct a community center, which would include the housing uh, management office, a early childhood education and wellness center, a neighborhood retail space, a police office, which is limited to 200 square feet, various parks, open spaces, community garden, as well as a transportation system and public improvements to the adjacent right-of-way. Here's a map of that. So as you can tell, their proposal includes a vast improvement in connectivity for the site and for adjacent neighbors through the site as well. Um, the new street system includes both connections north and south and east and west. And you'll notice that all of the dwelling units are on the northern part of the site, which is the R3.5 zoning designation. And the retail is on that bottom part of the site adjacent to Holcomb, also the um, Early Childhood Wellness Center is there as well. Up at that intersection, um, the, the southernmost intersection of the site, you'll see that community center. The applicant has proposed a various mix of dwelling units. So since this application is really dependent on availability of funding, they put ranges for mixes. So during each phase, a certain range of units will be developed. But there's a maximum on each range, so we know what that maximum intensity is. We can take that maximum intensity and figure out what our mitigation is for traffic and things like that. Um, if you look at the building types, you'll notice that multifamily has most of the, the multifamily type structures, has most of the dwelling units. Those are located on those two long buildings which are in the southeastern portion of the site, kind of by the, the little intersection there. All right. So they have proposed this development in a series of phases. Um, they anticipate starting 
the first phase next year, and last, the full bailout would be within five years. Now, again, because this is based on availability of funding, it may take up to 10 years, but there's the phasing plan they propose. Um, they're coming in with a couple of dwelling units and community center to begin with, um, and then they're kind of moving throughout the site from there. Now, they've, always, they've also applied for a National Resource Overlay District exemption. National Resource Overlay District, as you know, protects streams through the use of vegetated corridors. So the vegetated corridor could consist of native plantings to buffer between development and stream. So to the south of the site, on the other side of Holcomb, is Lindsay Creek, and there's also an, un an unnamed feature on the north corner of the site as well. So for the exemption, both of the sites are on the other sides of paved streets. And they're actually quite wide streets. Both um, have a width of a vegetated corridor of 50 feet, and that's from the break and slope of 25% or more. And if you measure from the break and slope of 25% into the site, the vegetated corridor wouldn't make it onto the site. Um, our end rod buffer is a little bit larger than what those vegetated corridor may be, just to provide for some sort of variance if there's any sort of mismapping or whatnot. Also, on the northern portion of the site, it only skims the site by eight feet, and that area is all paved. So there's an exemption in our natural resource overlay district. If you already have a paved surface, you're moving to a different paved surface to move exempt. So there's a plethora of code criteria that applies to this, but in bold at the bottom is the most uh, important one, which is our master plan section. The master plan section looks at compliance with the Oregon City Comprehensive Plan. You sign your staff report, analysis of findings. Um, the site, or this proposal, looks at housing affordability, mixed use, higher intensity development, development near transit lines, and things like that, which is encouraged in our comprehensive plan. The other code criteria are on this list because they'll be applicable when they either come into the detailed development plan or they've asked for an exemption or an adjustment to any of those criteria now. So, in the master plan process, you can ask for adjustments to the code. Uh, there's criteria that we use to assess those adjustments. Essentially, what we're looking at is, with this site in general, there may be one piece of code you cannot meet, um, but the project in general meets the intent of our code, the intent of the zoning designation, our comprehensive plan, and things like that. So, as you can see, the applicant has requested 13 adjustments. I'm going to touch on the two most important ones, and that is the first is number one, which is private streets. So the applicant has requested that in this master plan process, they vacate all the right-of-way that's in there, so those loopy streets that cut through the property. When they vacate the right-of-way, the right-of-way goes back to where it came from, so it would go back to the site um, that's where it came from, and then it would become part of that land of the site. Then, when they go to do their development density calculations, they can use that square footage to show that, you know, you meet your minimum lot size per dwelling unit. So that's one of the purposes for this adjustment. So how this adjustment would be implemented, though, would be constructed to the same standards that normal streets would be. So we're taking and we're putting public easements and access easements, utility easements, over all of these sites on the map. And then from there, we are allowing the public to use them as streets and requiring that they're built to street standards. So the first adjustment is to take the word right-of-way, streets, and whatnot, and replace it with the easements shown on the snap. The second adjustment um, is a, an adjustment to the minimum lot size and the R3.5 zoning designation. So they went around this by two ways. There's two separate reductions. So there's 27 dwelling units um, that may potentially be home ownership units in the future, and they're identified in figure two of, of spaces 2D, 3D, and 4D. So those dwelling units, you'll see they're kind of on the edges of the site. For those lots, um, they propose an adjustment to reduce the minimum lot size from 3,500 square feet per unit to 1,800 square feet per unit. And then the second adjustment is for everything else. And so for everything else, rather than 3,500 square feet per unit, it would be 2,964 square feet per unit. 
so about a 500 uh, square, square foot adjustment there. So <clears throat> as for the findings of this adjustment, one of the criteria is you know, you're meeting the intent of our code. So what is the intent of our code? Holcomb Boulevard right there in that slice you see in those pictures, that's zoned MUC1. So what the applicant did is they showed that they could build everything but 44 dwelling units on the northern part of the site. So they have 44 dwelling units left over to account for. So they did this diagram to show that they could account for those 44 dwelling units in the MUC1 portion of the site. So they did a parking analysis to show they can physically fit the actual units as well as their associated parking on the site. And then the reduction is really um, what you might think of as a density transfer. You're taking your 44 units and rather than building on the, on the MUC portion, you're building them on the R3.5 portion of the site. Um, and you'll notice in your staff report that finding. So as a condition of approval to ensure that they're not double dipping um, in the MEC1 zoning portion of the site, we allow up to three stories. Um, so they would take stories two and story three where they show that they could construct those 44 dwelling units and they would not be able to build additional stories there. So they could only build a one story building over that early childhood education and family wellness center. So that space is kind of off-site since it's um, transferred to the R3.5 portion. Um, all right. So, of course, there was a traffic study done with this application. Um, we had a lot of comments on the traffic study. We had the a comment from ODOT identifying certain errors in the traffic study and then that's the the traffic study. They didn't suggest that we redo the traffic study, but they did suggest at the end of the day that we charge this site system development fees and earmark those system development fees to pay for phase two of the drug handle project, which you saw a couple weeks ago. So um, John Erplinger, our city consultant traffic engineer, has reviewed the traffic study numerous times and in his opinion and actually written from ODOT as well, the specific errors that were identified, some were validated and some were not, but at the end of the day, they wouldn't really make that big of a difference. So it's not as though they would, there's no study that says any intersection would fail or not fail. They're kind of little tweaks to the traffic study. So the city's response to this is that we are collecting system development charges for this study, for this application when it comes in. SECs are charged for all development, um, they get credits for what's there. The phase two of the drug handle is listed in the TSP CIP, so the CIP is the Transportation System Plan. And when we calculated our SDC fees, we took into account ODOT facilities, and the city pays a 20% 20, 20 reimbursal to ODOT projects. And so we took that fee that we would potentially pay for ODOT projects and we built that into our FTCs. And then when someone goes to develop a building, house, anything like that, they get charged as SECs. And those SECs go into a large fund. Well, it's illegal to earmark any specific project, but they go into a big fund and the fund pays for each of these projects listed in the CIP. And phase two is listed in the CIP. So the city's response would be essentially every project is putting into phase two of the drug handle because they're all paying into this general fund. And with that, the city recommends approval of planning file CP 1002 and WRT 1005. We have five suggested conditions of approval. Most of them are pretty standard, complying with fire um, regulations once they start to come in with those detailed development plans. Again, exclusion of those second and third stories over the footprint um, of the building in the MEC portion of the site. Are there any questions I can answer this time? I, if, if, I could, if I could add one yeah. point about the FPCs that we that we calculate, I may recall that we've done a Beaver Creek concept plan, a uh, park place concept plan, and from that we identified infrastructure improvements that are necessary to implement both those concept plan and, and development in those areas. And from those plans that we created for the infrastructure improvements, we did update our transportation system plan and our system development charges to reflect those needed improvements associated with implementing both of those concept plans. 
In addition to that, um, and I'm sure you may recall, but I want this to get, in, to get in the record as well, is that the city has taken the extra step of identifying all the needed improvements on the state highway system. So um, the intersection with uh, 213, 205, 213 as it continues through our city along uh, Redland, Beaver Creek Road, uh, Glen Oak, also 99E uh, through the city. And we've identified the transportation improvements needed on the state system, and we've charged uh, 30% of those projected costs and incorporated those into our system development charges. So in effect, we are collecting for the state highway system, even though we don't need to at the local level. But since those are such uh, large uh, infrastructure projects needed in the city, uh, they do serve a regional demand, but the city is stepping up to start collecting those fees so that potentially down the road we would have a local match which would make it much more attractive and easier to get federal and state funding to make improvements to those state facilities. So um, it's not as if we're collecting SDCs and we're just going to apply them somewhere else in the city. We are collecting and have identified improvements on that state, on those state facilities that uh, do go into the larger system development fees that we collect. Um, and, you know, while it technically may not be illegal per se to earmark, we we collect on a, on a ratio. Each house that is built in the city contributes to citywide improvements, uh, whether it be for the transportation system, the sanitary sewer system, or the water system. Um, so to just take one system development charge and put all of that towards one project, that's, that's not the way it's set up. That's not the way we do it. It goes into a pot. It's for larger infrastructure improvements citywide, of which residents will utilize multiple streets in the city that need improvements. So just, just to clarify how we collect and what is included in that system development charge fee. And so how frequently is the CIP updated or prioritized? Is that annual or is it reviewed and we can add um, uh, projects to the CIP list, to the capital improvement plan list uh, as, as needed. Mm -hmm. um, but it is reviewed based on uh, regional and state funding priorities and Money's available. And also, their comments were related to phase two of the drug handle, and there was a letter submitted from Nancy Crusher, our public works director, sitting here today that talks about um, our applications to fund that. We submitted certain applications to get money to fund that phase. It's just kind of far out, so we haven't obtained that funding yet. And we're also one of the few cities, if not the only city, that takes into account ODOT facilities for SECs um, as well. And at this time, I'd also like to enter a couple items into the record that were submitted after the staff report was completed. Um, the first one was the 1999 wetland inventory repairing assessment by Shapiro and Associates. That was actually left out of your staff report. The second one is comments from Larry Potter, our parks operations manager, noting that they had no conflicts with the proposal. The third of that letter we're referring to from Nancy Crusher, our public works director, city engineer, dated today. And the fourth is a letter from Gail Curtis at ODOT, dated today as well, um, talking about A, that they're not asking for the transportation study to be redone. Um, they're just looking at, you know, making sure that phase two of the drug handle project is funded. And phase two, um, by the way, is just that intersection of Redland Road and 213, which looks at redoing uh, left turn lane and the signal. Kind of. So they're going to add order one, two, three, and four. Those are the numbers yeah. that you That is. Thank you. And I guess just one of the things to discuss some of the, the, the questions about the transportation plan. Um, there's an August 20th, 2010 letter to, uh, to staff from Mr. Rutlinger that talks about. We're looking at 213 Redland, um, and I'm just going to quote this real quick. The development is calculated to add some additional traffic to the intersection of 213 and Redland, but the increase is very small. During the PM peak hour, for example, the increased volume associated with this development proposal is 46 trips, and that's the total for all the approaches, uh, as compared with the total PM peak hour entering volume of uh, over 5,600 trips. Um, so you're talking a very, very small proportion of new trips to that intersection, of which we feel that between the, the work that's gone into the design of that, the current request to receive funding to implement that, that phase two Redland Road 
improvements and the system development charges that were collected that identified that improvement and are already in that system development charges are adequate based on the number of trips that they're putting in there during that, that PMP hour. Yeah, that's the full build out. That is, and the 46 is at all points of the intersection, so all entry points is only 46. We're not just coming out of the PMP hour. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I do have a couple questions. So, phase one, we're, uh, I know this will require the, dem the demolition of all the, the existing housing uh, and roadway and infrastructure, and then rebuilding the infrastructure in phase one. My question is this, um, how will that impact our housing um, inventory on affordable low-cost homes, and for what period of time if we lose I don't know the number, but if we lose 250 homes or 150 homes and we go 20 years before we can fill those, that gap, how will that impact our, our inventory? Mm -hmm. well, let me just jump in one yeah. sec and back up one second. So I think I just want to clarify what I said that, that that was 46 increased additional trips because you're already getting credit for some of the existing homes that are there. Right. Okay, I just wanted to put it's not, it's an yeah, increase. Cool. So that's that increase. Gotcha. Right. Yeah, that was clear. So the the applicant can uh, clarify a little bit better as far as the timing of when the residents would, would, would be notified and asked to move out and when the new homes would be ready. But the whole plan in general is proposed to be implemented within five years. So all 283 dwelling units would be on a five-year plan and they'd start to come in slowly, um, a little piecemeal at a time. But the applicant can better respond to your question. So from the city's perspective, that's going to meet our requirement for low in, low income, low cost housing. We'll have enough homes. We'll have enough in our inventory. Am I asking the right question? I'm, I'm you, right. you are asking a, a very important question. We are required to, you know, our conference plan that you guys spent a long time looking at. Um, this was an important topic on it. And I, I think the answer is most likely that, and, and this isn't something that's been brought up, that the approval of the 253 units here in the concept plan would likely, um, you know, assume that they're they're going to be built it's, if there's a, something goes sideways in the building. Because inventory is not a constantly updated uh, inventory. What happens is get inventory gets created when the next time you do the comprehensive plan. So, you know, if in fact you're going to do an update a year and a half in and something solved this project and only 20 units have gone in, then you may have an issue. If the inventory happens six years from now and it's gone according to plan, it's not going to have any effect on your obligations. You know, there's, there's no requirement for the city to update its inventory continuously. Does that... That answers that answers my question. I, I, I'm just concerned, always concerned when we're when we're basing the development on on uh, funding mm -hmm. capability. Absolutely, that there this that this it could impact if we're going to have homeless or you know, people that are no longer in those homes. Mm -hmm. Where are they going to be if they're going to stay in the district or in the city yeah. or, or in the county? But I mean, regardless of your housing obligations, you know, your, your obligation as a city to, to make sure there is affordable housing, something that, that I think is, is an important policy for the city. That's a great question and, and something you might check with the applicant to find out just how committed the funds are. Yeah, I mean, that's great. Thank you. I do have a question, Paul. Also, <clears throat> where are we not in, right now, let's say, in terms of uh, our inventory for affordable housing? Remember, a little bit more than real quick on our comp plan. I, uh, when we updated our comprehensive plan in 2004, we were compliant. Um, so, we haven't updated it since then. We haven't gone through periodic review. Um, well, we were compliant, but, but when we had a Walmart application, and not to bring that back up, but that was one of the criteria, that, that but losing that, that development there, those homes, would, would in fact potentially put us in a bad position. And you're right, and if someone's going to come in for a rezoning that's going to affect affordable housing type um, zones, they're, they're going to have to look at that. Yeah. So that was going to be a loss of, of that multifamily. Uh, as is this yeah. for a short period of time, and I, I'm, I'm not concerned. I'm, I'm, I'm not concerned today. I'm only concerned long term, and I'm concerned if, if this stalls and you have a uh, and, and the plan is developed over 25 years. So you know potentially we could be in a situation. And I just want to make sure that we're thinking through that as we go through. The process. I think that maybe like uh, Mr. Bison said, maybe something the applicant can elaborate on how 
much funding would come in in that initial phase if there are some housing units associated with that initial demolition. And then this, I guess the follow-up to that would be, and what percentage of those do we, would we require and should we require in phase one to, to meet our goal? That's something to think about. Um, the second question I have is, um, you have uh, Laura showed us uh, uh, these two, two or three story level building. Mm -hmm. it, it appears to me to look at the plan that there's only, there's only one that's going to be in that situation. Although you mentioned it in other places that there are uh, residential units and are those residential units going to be in um, multiple story buildings or is this going to be the only tallest building that we have to concern ourselves with in that entire development? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the applicant hasn't requested an adjustment to height. So we know for the MUC portion of the site, it, the maximum height it could ever be is three stories, but over that blue portion of that building, it can only be one because we took away those top two stories. And then the northern part, portion of the site that's owned R3.5, the maximum height is 35 feet or two and a half stories. So it cannot be any taller than that unless they come back with another request for an adjustment to that standard. Um, those details will kind of get hashed out at that detailed development plan which is that type two decision where we just go through and make sure it meets height. Um, there would be the multifamily ones would go through our site plan design review process, and then any type of land division would go through a land division process as well. Great, and the reason I ask that question is yeah. if, if in fact um, funding becomes an issue and these are less expensive to build in that mm -hmm. type of environment, is, is that something that they would be more and we can ask the applicant, but more, more focused on building is two or three story buildings as opposed to individual buildings mm -hmm. that are cheaper and more efficient to do it that way. Mm -hmm. no, that's a good question. And they have in their proposal, they limit the number of square footages mm -hmm. that they have proposed. The number, you can kind of see they have, they have a lot of this figured out already um, as far as how many bedrooms, how many square footages. Um, and what types of buildings would start to get built. The, the exact look of them it hasn't been refined yet. Um, but the general idea and design of where they would be located, and you can see they're kind of further away from the property lines, um, adjacent to that upper right-hand corner where there's dwellings. There's basically um, accessory buildings along that, and then the dwellings are kind of buffered um, by those buildings. But they do have square footages for the amount of dwelling sizes, the amount of retail sizes, so there's maximums in there. But in that in in that chart you show that single family attached, comma detached. So it doesn't define which is which, and and that'd be something, uh, you know. And I don't want to I don't necessarily want to tie anything down to that. But mm -hmm. it, it, I don't know whether that's 99 maximum units attached or 99 detached mm -hmm. or a half and half or what. It's not defined clearly. And this is strange too because we're saying single family attached and detached, but we're not really sure where the property lines are. So it might be. Um, a bunch of detached looking houses that are all on one lot, so that makes a multifamily, but it doesn't look like a you know traditional multifamily complex. Right. So it's just those um, design types. So in general, um, approval of this general concept plan would would approve this general layout, not the specific footprint, but generally, you know, one's going here, one is going here. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they have to meet the height requirements, so they can't just transfer out. If they want to do an adjustment, they can uh, have to come back for a adjustment to the concept plan if they want to change the design that significantly. Yeah, it just feels specific, and that's what I'm concerned mm -hmm. about. If you don't if you want to come back and change it, if it, mm -hmm. it doesn't specify right there, and there's not, in my mind, not enough specificity as to what's attached and what's detached. And again, mm -hmm. while I don't want to tie it down specifically, mm -hmm. it would just be kind of nice to know. Yeah, you what can we're looking put at. conditions of approval on there and. Uh, and that's something we can talk about at another point here. But mm -hmm. And then uh, the last question I have, sorry to take the chair here, but the, the last question I have is there was a comment in there about the police responded um, that uh, the negative about this uh, application saying that they're already overstaffed, and especially in a low income environment. Um, mm -hmm. But the response from the city was that this has, in, in you know, I guess you'll have to find it because I couldn't find it in my document, but it said that the um, this development had already been planned in, so it would not be an impact to mm -hmm. the police because it's kind of pre planned. Can you go into that a little more detail? When we did yeah, our inventory. Yeah. yeah. It, it was when we did our inventory of police, um, our housing in inventory and whatnot, 
that's when we figure out what our police numbers are and sort of what our potential development would be in the future. And that was done before this, and that was all sort of, you know, the density of the R3.5 mm -hmm. was already in there. Um, it didn't specifically talk about, you know, the income level or anything like right. that. Right, right. The 3.5, that's the key here, is, is if, if this area, as, it's, as it is today, mm -hmm. 3.5, mm -hmm. is way different than it's going to be at 3.5. And I guess that's the, my question is, while we're looking at it and calling it 3.5 and saying that we're, we're our police are, are positioned to, to manage that in a 3.5 zoning, mm -hmm. but is it is it a complete build out? And you know, so I'm, I'm and, I, and I hear from the chief that, that mm -hmm. they have concerns about that. So and then the other way to <laughs> mitigate that too is then with the 200 square foot office, um, so they're providing service or a facility for the police to use if they want to write reports or anything like that. Which they, they, yeah, they, yeah, yeah, which is there now, correct? I mean, I think they have a, they have an office there now, or is that no? They do not. They don't. They did Okay, it seems like they used to. And I guess you know the hard part with uh, police and law enforcement services is that um, we don't have a prescribed officers per thousand. Um, we don't have a requirement in the land use code that says we shall always maintain. X per thousand, X, X uh, law enforcement officials per thousand. So, you know, you've got a you've got a use that's that's permitted. It's it's working within the, the allowed densities on the property. Um, which, so it makes it difficult. I understand where where the police chief is coming from. There's a concern about increased density and the amount of calls and additional calls that may be needed to serve that area. Um, and then the other component of that is that. We don't collect system development charges for police services. Um, we don't charge a fee. You know, it's, it's from the general fund, and to some extent, you know that that tends to be a political decision in terms of police funding. And if those needs have been um, identified and, and adequately put into the budget, you know, I would point out that we have the city make making strides to add law enforcement employees. Um, we've added quite a few uh, within the last year to try and beef up the number of um, service uh, law enforcement that we have per thousand. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, while I understand where the police chief is coming from and I understand what his concern is, um, it's difficult to use that as, a, as an approval criteria for the staff in that I don't have one. Sure. Well, I just wanted to clarify the statement that you guys did gave to us, and that was that that, that had already been taken into account in that 3.5. I just want to clarify that so we all know what we're talking about. Um, that, that's it for me. Any other questions of staff before we go to the applicant? No? All right. Well, thanks for your patience. Um, thank you, Laura. Uh, this time, then, we'll call up uh, the applicants for their presentation. And if you'll introduce yourself in your city residence. Good evening. Uh, I'm Peter Anderson. I'm the executive director of the uh, Housing Authority of Clackamas County. Um, I have with me Ann Leininger, who's a county commissioner and um, member of our board of commissioners, and Steve Morrow, who's a co-applicant with the Housing Authority and has been a tremendous partner throughout this process. Uh, Ann and Steve are going to um, be part of this presentation as well. Thank you. Um, thank you. I wonder if I should first take a couple minutes to address some of the questions, or should I do that later? That, up to you. No, you I, I don't want to mess up your presentation. Do, uh, do it as you want. Those are some things that I uh, need to Okay. And we can be pretty free, free flowing here. A um, couple, couple of pieces. Um, in terms of the demolition and build back and the timing, um, you are absolutely correct that the build out of this thing is grant funded. There's a very key component to the funding, which is called a HOPE 6 grant. It's available for housing authorities to apply for through the federal government, through, uh, through HUD. We won't move forward on this project unless we get that grant. And that includes demolition? Right. Okay. So that grant will help us pay for the demolition, the infrastructure, and then um, phase one, which is 130 affordable housing units. So even if we get through phase one, we've 
gone above and beyond in terms of replacing the existing 100 units. So uh, addressing your concern about meeting your goal 10 requirements. Um, phase one, again, if we get the grant, we've covered, we've replaced at least what's there and added units in terms of your goal 10 question. Okay. Is, that, is that helpful? That, that is. Yeah, I guess I just have one follow-up question, and that's assuming, assuming you're, you're assuming our other grants set at level funds, and then it's uh, just a simple application, or or is that a moving target made per Congress? Yeah. It's uh, the overall hook six pot of money that we're applying for. It changes annually per Congress. You're correct. Um, the notice of funding availability for this grant application was just released last week. Um, it's due November 22nd. Um, we've been anticipating this release and thus all the planning and the timing why we're here tonight. Um, it's highly competitive and so we put together a tremendous team and a tremendous plan and we're working really hard to compete nationally uh, to bring that resource to this project and to this community. Um, so it, it is an uphill climb. Um, and again, we're not going to we're not we're not going to relocate any tenants. We're not going to put a shovel in the dirt until we know whether or not we have that grant. And, and that grant had a high enough level to do that, right? Okay, right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, another, I hope that that it clarifies a number of pieces there in terms of the timing of the grant, the importance of the grant. Um, great, thank you. Um, Police issues. Um, you know, we had um, Lieutenant Nunes as part of our advisory committee um, through, through the design process and really appreciated her participation and input. Um, some of the things that um, I just wanted to share with you that we're working on um, to mitigate some of the concerns you've heard about the potential increase of calls. First of all is that we're designing a mixed income community here. Um, ranging from home ownership to workforce housing to very low income public housing. So, um, you know, our hope is that the diversity of people um, helps to mitigate some of that on the street activity or neighborhood activity that people are afraid of. Um, another thing, as mentioned, is um, offering that space for uh, the officers to be present on site and so that they're visible. Um, another thing that we do is on-site property management. So we have our maintenance guys in blue shirts on the properties with a lot of intention of, you know, that's a, that, you know to, to have presence on the properties. Um, two other pieces. One is the design for the site includes um, a design concept called defendable space. Um, so it's very intentional to um, straighten the roads and create opportunities where neighbors, police, residents can look down the corridors, be able to lean out and see what's going on down the street. Um, also, very intentionally, we wanted to put um, front porches and bring people out um, so they can see what's going on on the street. Um, the final part of the site design includes a world of outdoor activity for people to be engaged so that, again, people are co-mingling on the street, being engaged with each other. And we think these are some of the softer, you know, non-police related ways to deal with um, some of the um, crime or criminal elements. Sure. Well, creating a good neighborhood is the best way to do it. I agree. Thank you. So now I'll get into our presentation, if you will. Um, let's see. So first I wanted to say it's, it's been a real delight um, to work on this project. We're very, very excited to be here in front of you this evening. Um, we, I want to say, express a lot of gratitude and thanks, um, number one, to our residents who have been participating with us the whole way, and we've got a number of them in the audience. If you all could just raise your hand, say hello. Um, I'm just delighted they would come out and continue to be a part of this. Um, also very, very thankful for the neighborhood residents and members of the Neighborhood Association. Just um, from day one, they've been very engaging, um, uh, very easy to work with. Um, gave us great input, and uh, again, I just really appreciate um, their participation as well. Next, I'd like to just thank the city staff. Um, they've been great to work with, giving us um, wonderful uh, guidance through this process, um, helping make sure that we are crossing our T's and dotting our I's. Um, related to that, I want to thank the housing authority staff who have been working with your city staff. Um, our staff has put in a lot of hours to bring this proposal to you. 
Um, next, I want to thank our consultant team, who I think you will meet later on this evening. Um, they're the folks in the front row here in the audience. They'll be able to answer your technical questions. Um, and then lastly, I want to thank Steve Morrow, who you'll hear from later. Steve's been just a tremendous partner from day one, um, willing to go down this path with, with us to dream a little bit and consider what's possible uh, on the site and with this master plan. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Langer and um, have her give you a little bit more about our, our project. Thank you. Well, it is a delight to be here and talking to you because this is a really pivotal moment. <laughs> this microphone. <laughs> In the life of this community. Uh, I was thrilled to have um, at least two people here on the dais to talk about the need for affordable housing. You may really know that, that there's a wait list of 3,500 people who need and qualify for affordable housing in Clackamas County and who can't yet get it, which is a hard economic time, even harder to weather. And here we have um, a wonderful 20-acre site with units that are well-maintained, but a hundred of them that evidently get really hot in the summer and are hard to keep warm in the winter. And we have a federal government program is going to give out money somewhere in the country, whatever we do, we have a chance to bring a bunch of that money, $20 million, to Clackamas County to be part of an $80 million total project budget. We have a chance to compete with the state of Oregon for dollars that are going to be given out somewhere in Oregon anyway. And bring a lot of those dollars to Clackamas County so that we can essentially triple the density of a wonderful piece of property in a wonderful area so that it can serve more of the families and seniors who need affordable housing. And in the process, we can create 500 potential construction jobs and we can create an energy efficient net zero at opening campus that offers Head Start services on-site, counseling, mental health services, um, clinic services that help crack the nut of how you do transportation for, for low-income families, people who may have disabilities, when you're not, you know, right on a light rail line, you're not right in downtown Portland. So not only could we be creating a great resource for our community, but we could be creating a model that is relevant all around Oregon all around the country in places where you're not in the middle of a really densely built downtown. So this is a tremendous opportunity and I'm so excited at all the enthusiasm that we've encountered as we've been working through this process. You know, as, as Carol was thanking all those people, I thought to myself, you know, you only get to thank that number of people when you've been doing a really big outreach process. And this has been a really exhaustive, and good faith outreach process, 20, over 27 community meetings over a nine month period of time, including a cultural audit where some where, uh, of our consultants went around to the community in the neighborhood of, of the project and, and kind of in the larger area and asked people what they thought the distinguishing features were, what it really mattered to them, you know, trying to get a read on what will fit well because this project. This set of homes and families is about fitting well and being a positive feature in this community. And that's why it's adding, replacing the public housing units and adding some more. And it's also adding mixed income, uh, some home ownership opportunities. It's going to revitalize some wonderful commercial space. I feel like it's going to meet a bunch of these. And that is why I think the community has been so positive about the, the possible introduction of this new um, development and all the jobs it will create and all the revitalization and opportunity that it will create for people of a whole bunch of incomes and a whole bunch of ages here in Oregon City. And I thank you for listening to us. I hope you'll look at this project with um, open mind, open hearts, and the, the can-do attitude that really characterizes our community. So thank you. I'm going to pass it on to uh, Steve. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Steve Marlon, but um, the community's kind of outreach, you know, it's been low income for years, ever since I grew up in the neighborhood. And we're trying to, ever since I bought the store probably 12, 13 years ago, I've been saying, you know, we need to do something, we need to develop. We need 
you know, bring this up to par. And Trell came in and, that, and I, you know, said, hey, let's see what we can do. You know, we've been trying to work, trying to develop the commercial mine a little bit more if I needed, maybe make my store a little bit bigger. And uh, Trell came in with this, you know, hey, this is some great, this is great, this is a good idea. Talked to a lot of the, commu- you know, the community, I talked to customers wide. Some of them were a little skittish, but uh, they all came around because it's like I said, it's going to be much better. It's going to be a neighborhood. Bring the neighborhood up, and it won't be called a project anymore. It would be more of a uh, mixed use for community. And so uh, I've been kind of behind it the whole way. I feel like it's going to be a plus for the Park Place community or what they call it, Dragon Sites or whatever it's all going to mix. And I see a plus for the commercial along with, you know, uh, the community. And I feel like the whole hill can, it will definitely benefit from the development. And uh, I know uh, Corral has spent a lot of time and all of his people have been great. I mean, they've had so many meetings and I've listened to, you know, a lot of them. And uh, I think it's just going to be a plus for Oregon City. Great. And thank you. You bet. Thank you, Steve. Wish you would do. Any uh, questions of the outcome of this time? I have a couple questions. How is the displacement going to work? So, how many folks are going to end up having to be displaced, and how long will that be for? Do they intend, or do you intend for those folks to come back? And secondly, you mentioned uh, home ownership. How does that work? If, if is this wholly entirely owned by Clackamas County? Is that correct? At this time, do you sell off portions or lots of that, and how does that work? I'll start with the home ownership component. Um, likely, we are going to end up selling off pieces of this either to some of the home ownership developers and or um, perhaps other nonprofit partners who we might bring on to build some of the other um, workforce housing components of this as well. But um, except for Steve's parcel, which I, I think you know, which is his, the southern parcel, the housing authority does own the other 20 acres. Um, let me distinguish between the housing authority and Clackamas County for just a moment. We are an uh, uh, independent organization under Oregon statute. Um, we are also under the administrative purview of the county. So while we are a separate agency, we, you know, we do report up to the county uh, chain of command and governance. Um, so the, we are anticipating probably selling um, lots to those homeownership developers. Um, I can't make a firm commitment, but I can tell you that we've had very good partnership discussions with Habitat for Humanity and the Clackamas Community Land Trust, who are considering coming in and being um, partners with us in the homeownership development component. Um, and we would eventually deed those properties over to them in that in that effort. Um, so the relocation, huge, great question, and a huge part of this. Um, with the grant funds, comes uh, an equal amount. We have 100 units and 100 households. So what comes if we get the grant is also 100 new um, housing choice vouchers. Um, you've heard of the Section 8 program, long time in the community. We administer that as well. These act is the same way. So what we get when we get the grant is we also get these vouchers to assist families in relocating. And what we do is we enter into a very intensive phase where we go in and meet with each individual family and create individual relocation plans with these families um, and help them determine, you know, do they want to stay in the neighborhood? Do they want to use this opportunity to move somewhere else in the community? They can even move somewhere else in the Portland metro area. Um, But these vouchers allow for those choices and that mobility to happen. The folks will also have the choice to move back. Um, once the units are built. Um, and so it's a great question and it's a very intensive phase once we get the grant, we get into developing those individual um, relocation plans with the individual families to meet their needs. One of our um, concerns, and we heard this from the families, is we don't want to be relocating people in the middle of the school year um, because of the kids. And so that'll be, we'll have to, depending on the announcement of the grant and our our timing, that will be a really important piece um, as, as we start the project. When can we start relocation, making sure it's not in the middle of the school year? I guess for me, that would also tie right back into what our current, or at that time, what our housing inventory would look like uh, for affordable housing for folks to be able to use those vouchers and stay within the city. So the way, well, 
the way the bank works is people can go rent in market rate units. Um, the units that the voucher folks go rent in are privately owned and are market rate. Um, so it doesn't need to be an affordable unit that the folks take the voucher to. Thank you. Oh, well, sir. Uh, I had a question uh, about the, the open space, the, the uh, community garden, the little pocket parks, the community park. Um, how will those be managed? Will they be under the city's purview? Will we get that land be city? I didn't see that in the, in the, in the uh, information. Uh, and if, if so, I, I noticed that our uh, parks department said they had no issue with it. Um, that's why I was curious. We've um, not had specific conversations with parks department or um, Tony about, um, about that yet. Um, I think we want to assume deeding the property to the city, um, but we, we frankly haven't gone that far yet into that detail. At this point, um, there's public access easements over some of those open space park areas in the application. So, so cur currently, currently the property that's that, that they're on now is any of that open space? Is that anything that the city is responsible for? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's all basically at the county level. The mm -hmm. remainder, is right? Okay. Are our parks part of our SEC makeup? Yes. Okay. Sorry for jumping. No, not a problem. And uh, the next thing with the natural habitat area, I um, okay, I, I assume that's going to be the same. Would be the same. Same conversation. I. Imagine that we retain that and take responsibility for maintaining that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think a little different question. Um, you know, as a planning commission, we're looking out for the big picture. I've been planning for Oregon City, and uh, you know, one of the one of the uh, things that we feel really strongly about in, in Oregon City in the comp plan, we've identified that we'll build a sustainable future. You know, everybody says that. So I'm looking at the plan, and, and actually. Um, you know, when I look at the staff report and all the work that's been done and the team that's been put together, I'm just, it's, it's extraordinary. It's really well. It's really well done. I guess my my questions relate more to, I want to hear more about the details about this community, about why this, this and, I, and I realize that we're in a concept plan stage, and so things can shuffle around a little bit, but, you know, starting to lock in a little bit. You know, the streets are starting to be defined, but, you know, areas where it's uh the natural habitat area. And I just, I guess I want to hear more about why this is an extraordinary place, you know, why this is an extraordinary place. And as an architect, I mean, I can see a lot of things already in place, the Central Park, some other things, but I guess I just want to hear more about the planning of this as a social problem, as a social solution, as an environmental solution. You know, I, I, I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah. I think so much of it is programming, is yeah. kind of what I would say, mm -hmm. versus the planning and the land yeah. use. And the, because the, the, the layering of right. the groups, you know, from low income to home ownership, that's a, quite a strata right there. So, in and of itself, that's extraordinary to get all that in a small area. So, in terms of programming for sustainability, I mean, really, it really does start with the site design. And um, it, there was a lot of discussion during our um, design correct. We had a week long design correct. A lot of discussion about sustainability. And um, one of the things, and I won't get this right and I'll defer to the design team for later, but um, one of the things I really took in mind was to make sure that the street grids, but more importantly, the layout of the roofs are um, facing, I believe it's south and west for the sun. Mm -hmm. um, so that number one, um, the uh, natural lighting um, can happen you know, naturally. Mm -hmm. um, but second of all, when we go to some system of um, solar system or whatever it is, heating or as technology increases, we don't know where solar is going yet, but it's all laid out already so that we can convert to solar as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I would say that's how the site design starts. In, in addition to the, um, you know, the runoff requirements, you know, and, and stormwater requirements mm -hmm. and all of that. In terms of the rest of the programming, I, I think that's where we're actually really excited in putting a lot of energy to it. Um, we're engaging Oregon Energy Trust. Um, to make sure that um, we're accessing their programs, rebate programs, and technical assistance as we design and build the units for energy efficiency. 
Um, we are hosting, uh, we're going to start hosting, um, we call them Echo Threats, where we're inviting architects, engineers, you know, um, those who are really into the energy business, energy conservation, frankly, energy production business, to help us really think through in more detail how do we build energy efficient and one of my goals, you know, I'm, I'm getting nervous saying it publicly because somebody's going to hold it to me someday, but um, energy producing um, units. Um, and then um, finally, we're also talking with the um, Portland, Oregon Sustainability Institute um, about. Um, the concept of designating this site and this neighborhood um, an echo district. Um, and so I think there's seven, Mary, is that right? Echo, five echo districts established right now. They're all in Portland. Um, we'd be the first suburban. Uh, and echo what is it? What, what's an echo district? Wow, I should probably let Mary describe that a little bit more. Um, I mean, it sounds like a great idea, and I like it associated with this project. Hi, I'm Mary Bradshaw, and I work for Brown. So, in um, Echo District, what it came about was trying to figure out kind of a district wide strategy to be able to tackle a variety of sustainability issues. So, whether it was energy conservation or transportation. So. In Portland, these five established eco-districts that they're working with all have different kind of issues that define sustainability for them. And one of the key principles is coming up with a governing body that is very representative of everyone, that um, builds kind of a broad-based constituency, um, whether it's landowners, whether it's people that work in the district, people who live in the district, um, and try to kind of identify a list of priorities for sustainability. So one of the things that we've talked about if you did this governance overlay as an eco-district is that our project would be kind of the center of this eco-district, but that it's very much the park place neighborhood and we would build this body that would come together and decide what's most important looking forward to this neighborhood to have a sustainable future. They could identify energy efficiency, um, transportation, which is a very real one in the Park Place neighborhood as well. And that this body would then come up with ways to be able to make changes over the long term, whether it's solar installation on our side or making solar panels available for our neighbors at a low cost, if that was something that they had decided to do. And POSI, as they're called, would work with us to be able to build that governance structure kind of assess what the neighborhood needs, and then help us make that plan to move forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm the only person up here now. Making the technical possible. Well, I had a couple questions about traffic. Yeah, that's the one, and, and I, and anybody's ever read traffic reports, you want to see them all the, well, I, I, I see the numbers, and it, it, it's, I understand basically the concept. I, my questions are, are what I would ask most people is that one, you're looking at changing, somewhat changing the, the, the area. You're adding more homes, obviously, so you're obviously going to have more vehicular traffic, more pedestrian traffic. Um, more than different types of travel. You're going to have families as opposed to just, you know, people riding a bus perhaps or mass transit or walking or pedestrian or bicycles. Um, have, we, have we taken into account the long term about, that, uh, uh, for instance, along Holcomb and the new proposed street, Front Street and Apperson Street uh, for signals, um, pedestrian crossings, um, it, it gets pretty hairy up there at, at rush hour. I've been there, I've seen it um, near the market and other places. And my, it concerns me a little bit that we've got, regardless of what the numbers say here, what we think is going to happen, it, it concerns me because I see a lot of traffic up there today. And when you triple what you have there today, and even if only half of them drive, uh, that, that's a considerable amount more traffic being funneled down onto Redmond um, 213. And, uh, and beyond. So I'm just wondering if there's a long term plan for that. Yeah. If I could jump in for a second. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, there are some proposed improvements for, say, like along Holcomb and whatnot. Um, there's a left turn lane that would go in from Holcomb into the site into the unnamed street. 
um, that will help take care of some of that traffic, and then also sidewalks and things like that along Holcomb, so there would be some sort of improvements directly adjacent to the site. I'm excited about the opportunity to have these sidewalks, and I'm not sure everyone can place this, and that's a, that's a great opportunity. Um, I guess I'm just looking at um, the long-term development, and short-term, and, and if you phase it properly, it, 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 things may just smoothly go together. Um, but if not, you know, then we're looking at possible long-term potential of having to put signalized intersections and and maybe testing crossings or over or things like that. And I just didn't, I, I don't know if um, the transportation advisory folks have an opportunity to look at that and if there's been any comment from Nancy regarding long-term effects of this. Yeah, their transportation study was done by Greenlight Transportation um, and then also, which I believe they're here, mm -hmm. and about that a little bit more as well, and reviewed by John Ressinger and um, both of those entities didn't find any trigger for any sort of signal or pedestrian crossing or anything. They just didn't meet those numbers. And for that issue regarding this traffic study, and I didn't have a chance to read that yet, uh, did that, that, was that, is, did that have anything to do with that? No, their issues were more with um, specific data that was used and a, a timing. Um, they took out numbers like, during March and in February, March and November. And sometimes traffic is slightly higher in the summer, so that wasn't adjusted. So just little things like that. But the overall transportation impact is so low that if you were to go back and adjust that, it's um, assume that that won't really make any difference. Nothing is close to being, you know, that close to being blown out yeah. as far as intersections and family and things like that. And the assumption, and I'll, you know, I'm sure you can talk about this, the assumption that the Redland Road, phase 2, 213, that's mm -hmm. going to be in effect with this application? Mm hmm that, that's, that's, that's the assumption. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that will make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. It's these technical questions where you get to meet our consultant staff. So uh, if you all could just come up to meet it and introduce yourselves, that'd be great. Um, my name is Christopher Stanley with Greenlight Transportation. There were a lot of uh, traffic questions in there, so you'll have to um, help remind me what they were to make sure I answer them. But, uh, Yes, we, we did look at the impact of the project on the system, both specific to the project, but also in context to the overall transportation system and then any other uh, programs and, and plans. And one is the Highway 213 improvements and the Phase one of that is the Washington Street improvement, and that's assumed in here. The phase two is the Redland Highway 213, and the drug study actually doesn't put that improvement in here to give you guys a conservative or a worst case result. But I think where uh, all, all the traffic consultants and ODOT are in agreement is that the, the city has a great plan and the way they set up their SDC because this project will contribute towards it. Um, there are also some questions about uh, Holcomb Road and how the, the side of the project will, will interact with that. And uh, the project is consistent with the Holcomb Boulevard plan. And in fact, my observation is the, the site widening actually widens more than the, the plan that's adopted by the city by adding a, approximately eight additional feet to provide on-street parking there. And then uh, one of the uh, outcomes from the traffic study is because there's several parcels here in there uh, zoned as mixed use, meeting access spacing standard is difficult and there's a lot of discussion on that, but trying to develop and set these up so that um, parcels, when they do redevelop the accesses, can be shared and they can work together to end up with a long-term plan that is uh, is efficient and works works well as a whole, not just looking at things individually. On the uh, Holcomb Boulevard and the the need for a traffic signal, it's unlikely that a traffic signal will be needed in the near term, but likely in the long term and 
a couple of the reasons are on the south side across the street from the project is where the steep grades are and so there's not a strong desti destination or origin there for a pedestrian uh, or, or bicyclist and um, also traffic signals are typically installed for the minor street left turn movement which is one of the, the lowest movements from this area that, so those would be people making a southbound left from Front Avenue towards the school where most of the destinations are to the north or the west. Mm -hmm. And then, though it's a, a pretty constrained area with the steep grades and Highway 213, there's a, actually a pretty good overall grid network set up where people do have an option they can take Holcomb down to Redland Road, but they can also just go Apperson North to uh, the Clackamas River Drive and tie into the new interchange there. And so the site's about in the middle if you were to look at travel times distances, which gives it a lot of flexibility um, uh, to, to flex with traffic, but also result in a development that uh, doesn't focus all its impact at one location. And then there has been some discussion that locally within the site, uh, it, there's been a lot of effort to make cross connections and a grid network so all these different modes can access the site efficiently, but also access the, the routes that have the least impact. Okay, and well, I've got you. Um, neighborhood retail is undefined at this time, it just says neighborhood retail. So, what criteria did you use when you talked about the potential of a neighborhood of whatever that retail may be, or if Steve's um, does expand into a larger facility or whatever happens in there? Is that been taken into account um, in, in turning, cross traffic, um, that type of thing, pedestrian? Um, yes, for, for the neighborhood retail. Uh, we picked a generic retail use, um, but one of the requirements will be when they come in with their specific uh, development plan, they have to revisit the, the traffic to make sure that it's consistent with what's going to be adopted in the master plan. And so with master plans and with market conditions, particularly these days, they seem to be changing a lot. And so um, what will be required is that uh, an inventory or a check to make sure that whatever's um, being approved is consistent with the traffic study um, going to generate comparable or less trips. If it's going to generate more, then they'll be required to address any specific or significant changes in use. Okay. Well, and you know, you know, again, the only concern I would have is, you know, if this goes through and it's approved and, and, and it happens to be, the retail happens to be phase four. And all of a sudden, it, it, it is deemed uh, necessary to have a large market or something like that. Um, and, and then all of a sudden, it goes over that threshold, and now we need a, a signalized intersection. It, it, it would concern me to in charge of the applicant who's doing a market for the entire you know, for the entire thing. But if we're getting SDCs and that's a little pot that could be used for that, um, then I'd be less concerned. Uh, it's, it's kind of a long term. And there is a, a good amount of flexibility at the, the driveways that are City Center is level service E. Um, they're working at level service B and C, and so there is a good margin there that can allow things to shift before they hit that threshold. Mm -hmm. And if I could, hi, my name is Kim Shocker. I'm an architect with the design team. Uh, the retail space that is being shown in that particular piece of the master plan is 2,000 square feet and has been looked at as a small retail for maybe a delicatessen or a, a coffee shop or something, uh, not something that would be sizable for a garage, I mean for a grocery store, it just didn't have that kind of square footage to it. So it's always been a pretty small piece. Yeah, and, and it just was undefined, so it's hard for us, for me looking at it, I don't know. So it's right. something that. Something that would be complimentary to Steve's market. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on traffic or other otherwise? I'm, I'm curious about um, the what are the risks of, of this project going south um, once it's started. Can, can you talk a little bit about um, similar types of projects and what kind of value they do bring to uh, the neighborhood where they happen? So 
Tommy and Ben up here to me and her friends have worked on several large projects like this, so um, also you can provide some perspective. Um, the risk, I don't know how to describe the risk, um, because it all starts with receiving that federal uh, funding source. Um, we anticipate that once we get going with the HOPE 6 grant, um, the other funding falls in place. We will have to apply, as Commissioner Leininger uh, mentioned, to Oregon Housing and Community Services for future phases um, for some of the workforce housing. Um, those are also competitive grants. Um, we are in discussions with the state about um, criteria around, you know, new criteria for projects that receive federal funds, receive higher scores, mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, we can be better, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the phasing of it is all tied to the various funding that we can generate. Um, we're going to borrow a lot of money, frankly. <laughs> Um, the resources we apply to at the state level are called uh, low-income housing tax credits. Again, it's a competitive process. We anticipate applying for probably three rounds of those, and so that's the phasing. Um, so applying for um, one, the projects are broken up into different, uh, you will group the homes, and that's a, a project for the tax credit application. And another group of homes or apartments is, is for another tax uh, tax credit application. So um, the risk is really how we fare in competing for those funds once we get started. So we get the we get the hope six grant, we get loan, we get the infrastructure in. Um, we will be presenting very, very competitive proposals because we're ready to proceed. We've got the infrastructure and the partnerships in place as we're applying to the state for those funds. Um, Clackamas County is being generous and committing uh, resources to help us along that path, um, that we can show map resources in those applications, both to HUD but also to the state, um, in terms of their home program and their block grant program. Um, and as other projects, um, and we might be able to speak to this uh, across the country, um, once you get them rolling, um, you know, there's a commitment by the housing authority, the governing board, and the partners to see them through, um, and really um, the risk is in how you compete for the funds. Mm -hmm. And once one of those funds, one of those grants is awarded, it actually makes the Housing Authority far more competitive for other grants along the way. Uh, when the Housing Authority uh, took the opportunity to create this redevelopment master plan, they really were looking at the criteria that Hope 6 and HUD are going to be looking for in competitive grants, and that's a highly sustainable community. Uh, one that is in partnership with other organizations and groups within the community, which the Housing Authority has been very um, persistent about making sure that we include everyone within the community. Also a focus on community health and public health and uh, making sure that this community takes a look at opportunities for healthier materials, more efficient buildings, um, places for the community to actively and passively be outside and so that we're looking at not only sustainability from an efficiency or a material standpoint, but from the sustainability of the people that live there. And so the Housing Authority has really stepped up to look at all the criteria to make themselves as competitive as possible for these very, very um, competitive grants. And so they stepped out and, and done those. And we have seen, um, in our experience working with other housing authorities and having successful Hope 6 applications, um, these communities are very successful. They, they become assets to the neighborhood with which they are located. Uh, one of the projects that we worked with with the Seattle Housing Authority was 160 acres, significantly larger than this, um, but was in far worse shape. I think the homes were in much worse condition. Uh, it was actually a much unsafer place, and now it's actually a destination, and it's a it's an internationally recognized community that is mixed uh, mixed income, mixed use, and is now a real asset. And that's that's the road that the Housing Authority is taking as well. I thought I had heard you say earlier, I just want to reiterate and like, uh, answer a little bit of where Commissioner Sainz going that you, if we get, if you get the whole six funding, phase one will cover demolition and reconstruction of at least as many. So we'll, we'll be, just just to kick it off, we're going to be having enough money to get us back to and then some uh, where we were, at least for affordable housing, okay, both and then the opportunities to add on from that. Correct. Both in terms of the unit numbers, but then we've also got the infrastructure in for the other projects to come online. 
I have a couple more questions, and easy one to think. Um, first question is the the medical facility and the um, child care, et cetera, et cetera. Will that be will that be a, a, a county uh, facility, or will that be a private facility? Um, we anticipate it'll be owned by the housing authority, although we are open to different ownership structures. Um, you know. Throughout this whole project, you know, we're open to having all kinds of ownership structure discussions. Um, mm -hmm. The primary objective for us is to get this thing built um, for it to be a great community. And if it needs different ownership structures, we're open to those conversations. Um, so we are talking very, um, uh, very diligently with uh, Head Start. Um, they are looking to co-locate. Um, their activity in the Oregon City area to this, we call it Early, Ch early Childhood Education and Wellness Center. Mm -hmm. So the Early Childhood Education component, um, we're thinking is Head Start and maybe another space for a privately run um, daycare. Um, and then the Wellness Center component of it, um, we're not envisioning a medical office per se, but um, we want to address the issue that um, many of our residents um, have barriers to transportation to get off to um, see, like, the, to the county health clinic or county mental health. So what we're talking about is building some space where um, a mental health provider or a county nurse practitioner can come on site, um, have private rooms and workable space um, to operate there, you know, two days a week. Um, and be able to host not only our residents but neighborhood residents as well. Um, so it's it's not exactly a medical facility, but right. but what we talk about is flex space um, that is shared and co-used by different providers. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Um, second question I have is um, in the in phase one. Um, if you are going to consolidate into one area in the the initial build. And if that's the case with the you know, farming from the fallow land, the, the land's not being used, what, what's the plan for uh, maintaining that property and that land so it doesn't become a, an eyesore? Yeah, um, I, wow. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I can imagine is that um, we would have, uh, you know, if materials are around, um, if you have open, if materials are around, we'll have security. If ditches are open, um, we'll have fences. Um, I, I really don't want to leave fallow ground for very long at all. I mean, it's unattractive to the neighborhood. It's it becomes a hazard. You know, that, that's not our intent at all. Sure. So um, I would assume that. I, I just it concerns me a little bit only in that it is phasing. And again, it's it's all based on whether we can get the money. If the phasing is is not there. Yeah. Um, and that's not a, that's not going to be a priority. Uh, I mean, infrastructure is one thing, but uh, you know, doing that properly is not going to be a priority. I know. What I can imagine is um, two things: um, the possibility of us putting down a bunch of sod um, and having a huge open space for a while until we can roll through our grant applications. The other is, and I say this a little bit lightheartedly, tongue in cheek, is that I'm sure Jackie Hammond, who runs the, she, she would love oh, to hold another party. She's been on our committee and it's a great asset. Yeah. 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 Unless you make your own bread now. That would be if I were a neighbor, if I were in that environment, uh, I would, I'd be interested to know that and what's really going to happen there, you know, long term in case the phase two and three were pushed out five years or something. There's something to think about in our, as we discuss for the run. Um, okay, great. That's all the questions I have. Yeah, I'd still like to hear more from your design team about this plan. Yeah. specific questions you'd like to hear no, about you know, some of the plans? Uh, you know, I'm just seeing a lot. We're, we're creating a little community here, and there's a lot of lives that and, and there's a there's a plan here that's somewhat somewhat fixed, and there's a lot of elements in it that are that are really interesting. Some that I understand, and then others that I don't. And I'm just wondering wh what you know. Connectivity, great. Okay, yeah. I see that one. Mm -hmm. um, so the community park to the sun. This is what I'm looking for. I want to know why this is a sense of place. What makes this a great place? Well, this particular site has a lot of existing amenities, and a lot of those are in the trees that are on the site. 
So uh, the community park certainly is one of the main features of this and is going to be the heart of this community, a place where we're going to have passive as well as active activities for uh, people of all ages, and not just for Clackamas and Spice itself, but for all of the Park Place neighborhood to come and enjoy. And that's one of the reasons we felt that connectivity was so important. We needed the, this community not only to start feathering itself back, but for the surrounding community to feel that this was part of, of their neighborhood as well, and start inviting people back. Currently, I think that the street system, these looping streets that are within the site currently, just aren't very uh, conducive for the community to feel connected. Um, and it also does, in this case, create some amount of uh, security and safety issues. So this connectivity kind of helps with that. Uh, we've left a significant amount of trees up in the natural habitat area because um, this really is a very natural feeling community with these two different, uh, we have the creek that's running to the south of us and then we have that natural system that's to the west. Uh, it was important for us to keep those trees and to create this natural uh, spine along the, um, the extension of Harley Street. The trees, I mean, the whole design was kind of working around these trees. There's 154 existing trees on the site. We saved 114. And the forty that we got rid of were ones that had been topped or branches were missing or things like that. So we worked really hard in creating that open space and making it all connect like a system like a like a pearl, a string of pearls through the park and people could walk through the site. And even where that central park is located, all the roads, every road that comes into the site goes by it or enters through it to hopefully bring in that surrounding community to the site. That was one of our big missions. And also now taking, taking all the open spaces and having homes front them instead of being tucked behind the homes like they were in the previous plan, where they weren't as safe, where there's eyes on the parks at all times and the police can see into the open spaces. Mm -hmm. so, so the basic concept that you have here is uh, the units are pulled more closer to the street, eyes on the street, parking behind. Uh, this is the basic idea of parking behind. So uh, I'm curious. Um, so basically it's driveways behind and then a lot of parking on-site, parking stalls, no garages or anything like that, right? Well, there are some, if you look closely, there's, um, we put carriages and they're really alleys and there's carriages okay. at the end of those with a unit above with a front porch. Okay, good. And part of it is so that people don't, you know, look like a big parking lot. It's mm -hmm. closed off, it's for the residents that live there, they go into their parking spot, and it's kind of a safe area where they can see their cars from their home. I see. So mm -hmm. at the beginning of all these little parking areas, the little shaded ones, these are the yeah. house. And that's there's the four arcade. cars, and there's mm -hmm. uh, like a front porch. So that provides the eyes on the street for that whole alley, and it makes it down so that it doesn't feel like a photo there. Yeah. And then, uh, then the other question I would have, and we're at such a, you know, yes. scale here and it's we're kind of here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is just, you know, how do you... Dimensionally, I'm just looking at it. I can see the size of the units. I can see about where your step back is. I can see front porch. I can see a little bit along behind. And then, you know, these parking stalls and stuff. And it just looks really tight for, like, getting, you know, swales to start working, like those yeah. those kinds of things. Is there, an, you know, are those being considered and yes. all, all yes. those kinds of things? There's a natural base system that's going to take the water all down Harley. And all of these streets have a side too, all the all the way in. Mm -hmm. And it's coming down to the end down here. Mm -hmm. And even in the back in the parking, there'll be an actual drainage to see what will take the um, water off the parking surfaces and into drainage areas mm -hmm. down through the alleys here. Every unit. Yeah, one thing's wider to allow for the natural drainage system. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's 13 feet on one side where we're going to have the natural swale. It's mm -hmm. the water. And some of it, it's also it's going to kind of carry through here and have a where we're taking the water kind of to the surface mm -hmm. there where you can see the natural drainage system will be the park and then it connects up into the natural habitat and there will be um, oh, the okay. area down mm -hmm. in this area, the low point of the site that we may have a small depression toward the water. So oh. where it comes, where it, where it actually daylights actually becomes an opportunity for education as well and how the soil and the plant life actually works to help filter all of that water before it gets into the stormwater mm -hmm. system. And everybody, one of the things we really try to do is to give every unit of their own private backyard where you have your own yard, where you can have your grill, you have your patio. Um, right now, it's kind of just a big open space that really isn't used very well. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we heard from the residents is nobody wanted to have their own private space, but we still provide a large space for community gatherings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah, that's, that's great. So I'm getting it. Because. Oh, you do with the colored one too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot more trees on that picture than the one up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just think that when it's all sudden going grants and loans and all the other people start living here, what kind of place is this? That's, that's really all that really matters here, really. Is, is what kind of place is this? Yeah. I mean, all of a sudden it's not important, but at the end of the day, it's mm-hmm. what kind of place have we created? And I just want to make sure. I know the team probably went through iterations and iterations and iterations mm-hmm. for lots of different reasons, and he came up with this one. You know, why? You know, what, what, what is it about this one? Because I, I know that it'll move a little bit, mm-hmm. something get a little bigger, something a little small, but really you're starting to set a lot of big pieces in place, and I just want to see that. Right. Well, we did. We went through a lot of iterations, and we were very fortunate to have a very active not only client group, but a neighborhood mm-hmm. that participated 100% of the time. And so this is actually the result of lots and lots of people sharing what they wanted the neighborhood to be and thus putting it into a master plan that would get to those goals. You know, one thing I wanted to point out, because I know this came up about the building sizes and the lights. And one of the things we really tried to do up on the outer edges along the edge of the neighborhood, we tried to replicate the size of building that is across the street. Mm-hmm. So it, it's kind of just a transition area. These are all duplexes or single homes along the edge as a transition in. And the only buildings that are larger buildings that are going to be stacked units of them are these larger buildings right here. Mm-hmm. We should have elevators and they're more aimed toward people with disabilities or seniors mm-hmm. to provide that type of housing. One last question on the community vegetable garden there. It's a neat spot. I would have thought originally that why isn't it in the center and kind of the middle of activity and all that. There's a scene that has that. I actually like it. Mm-hmm. I started to think about it and I actually kind of like it where it is because it actually acts as a really cool scene between this and, and everything that was existing and I think there's that cross yes. kind of thing happening where the community can be more mm-hmm. part of this and it can be more part of that. Inter- yeah, interestingly, the community garden that is existing on the site right now is one of the, the images that the rest of the community associates with Clackamas Heights. It's a very positive, very active um, little garden. And, um, something that we certainly wanted to preserve. And there were a um, number of locations that could have been, and it was located in this top corner because people really wanted that to be the gateway into this community mm-hmm. as well, something everybody could share. Mm-hmm. It's also great for some of their sunny rights. The water for could take it because yeah. the water actually flows that way. So. Perfect. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. If there's no more questions in the applicant, then um, we will. We have some folks who want to speak. Uh, let's see. Uh, first is uh, Linda Linda Israelson. Welcome. If you could just give us your name, city residence. Thank you. My name is Linda Israelson, and I'm a resident of Clackamas Heights. I live at five three five B Street in Oregon City. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I've lived in, well, I've been a resident of uh, Heisenberg, Clackamas County for 22 years, and 16 of those I've lived with my family in um, Clackamas Heights. And um, I know many of the residents will feel the same as I do, that this would be an excellent improvement as to uh, the residents that we are in at this point. I know they are built, I think, in 1941. So, uh, we need some grilling up in the park in the sites. Um, I think there would be a lot of good improvements also for our area. And also, um, that this plan would benefit Oregon City in many ways. And you've heard a lot of the good pluses about that. And I know that many of the, the people and the children there, especially, too, have benefited from the parks. And we have different programs and things that we have really um, been excited to have. So, this will probably even be more benefit to that, too expand and um, basically we just thank you for hearing us and hope that we have some favor and that this will come out and it'll be good for all. Have a good evening. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much for waiting. We appreciate it. Next is uh, Nancy Walters. Hello, I'm Nancy Walters, and I live um, in Oregon City, and I'm representing the Park Place Neighborhood Association tonight. 
Um, we submitted um, a letter of support of this project, actually a couple of um, letters, one for this hearing tonight and uh, one for the application. And so, um, as uh, you've heard previously, we have been very much engaged and very much involved in this process. Um, also wanted to um, talk about the fact that uh, the Housing Authority is really a central part of our neighborhood. Um, they host all of our um, community meetings, virtually all of our um, neighborhood meetings, and um, Steve's Market and, and Clarkham Sites kind of uh, form the nexus of that with the community garden and um, the only regional I mean, kind of the neighborhood market there. So they're really a vital part of our community and um, the Housing Authority has really formed a really nice partnership with the Neighborhood Association over the years and we've um, been able to work through a lot of our um, mutual concerns uh, together. So we're really um, privileged to be part of this and we think it's exciting that, um, that the neighborhood um, is looking forward to um, having uh, this facility here. Um, so I won't go through reading all of the letters uh, because of the time tonight, but I just wanted to talk about a couple of things. One, um, that this is really a unique project uh, for all the reasons that you heard, and also just wanted to touch on the fact that it was very collaborative, um, very inclusive. I saw, um, I think we had, um, probably 20 children uh, during the di design charrette process, all contributing, uh, residents, neighbors. In addition to, um, there were a variety of um, members on the advisory group um, from all over um, Clackamas County service agencies. We had people from the sustainability office in Portland, uh, just representing a lot of expertise in terms of building community and trying to um, look at sustainable ways to um, to, to um, come up with this plan. Um, the other unique aspect to this is that it's a not profit driven project. So we really feel that um, all of the value in this project is going to stay in the community because um, it's really not driven for profit. Um, the other um, really unique aspect of this project, we believe, is that it's geared towards really long term thinking. Um, this plan was put together looking at 100 years, how this would evolve over 100 years. The current uh, uh, current properties are almost 75 years old, and I think, um, you know, looking at what's going to happen in the future, it was really important to think about um, the long term, uh, what, what is this going to look like. So they really focused on sustainability, durability, how is it going to, how easily is it going to be maintained, um, those kinds of questions. So in all, I think I um, just wanted to highlight that this is going to add long-term value to our community. We were very involved in the process. And um, last but not least, I don't want to forget um, that we still want to uh, use the opportunity to call your attention to some of our um, existing transportation issues. We feel that the, um, the, the, the project really does reconnect this area um, to our community in a much uh, more pleasing and, and um, more effective way. And um, we hope that, um, that with this project and other projects that are coming along that we'll continue to look for ways to connect to this greater city at large and um, perhaps even extend the trolley line up the Oregon Trail uh, to this site as um, one of the future solutions. So thank you very much. Uh, that's all we have, uh, people have turned it in. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to speak uh, on this matter for or against or either, neither for or against or? Please come up. I'm sorry, uh, I, could you repeat that because you were just a little farther from the microphone? My name is Ida Jim Farns, and I live on Redwood Road. Thank you. And when I heard about this meeting, I felt like I should come because I wondered what was going to happen to the people from the time the, they started tearing the homes down until they got moved on or could come back to these new homes. Did you feel you got an answer tonight? Uh, not completely. Pretty close, though. Okay. Is there a specific question you want to ask? We can get an answer for you. When you decide to tear the homes down, there's going to be a period before the homes are going to be 
uh, rebuild, and where are these people going? Okay. Right. The, okay. Some of them own their homes, and some of them are on the uh, Section 8s and all this, and, and I know some of the people over there, and I kind of worried a little bit about them. Sure. Well, I, I appreciate that. I'm sure they appreciate it. We will get you an answer when the applicant comes up for rebuttal. I think they can address that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for bringing that forward. Anyone else in the audience like to speak? Okay. Now, at this point, then we will close the public hearing. And I'm sorry. Did you have a word for the We battled before we close the public hearing. See, I've already done this a little while. It's so long. <laughs> yeah, it takes a while. So now we'll have the opportunity to give a rebuttal. Thank you. I, I will just address the most recent question. Thank you. Um, the, the three things, the question, your concern, and um, wondering where folks will be located to and where they'll live um, in the interim. Um, so as we said previously, we'll use the opportunity to work individually with each family to help them decide, they get to decide where they want to go and where they want to live. Um, they're currently all renters. They will continue to be renters unless there um, is an opportunity for them, based on their individual household circumstances, to move into home ownership. Um, that will not be an emphasis of our relocation plan, but you know that's always part of the discussion. So um, some of them may end up living in Park Place neighborhood, renting in the Park Place neighborhood. Um, some may end up in the general Oregon City area. Um, some may choose to move um, to Northeast Portland because they've got family or friends there who they want to be with. Um, there's really a lot of options, and it's one of the intentions of the federal program and the federal money is to allow folks, um, long-term public housing residents, the opportunity um, to use the voucher um, and be more mobile so that they can get closer to work Close to the education, closer to their family, if they need to, or if the individual family plan suggests, we help them find a new place to live very close to where they are today. So, regardless of, of, of what position they're in in any of this, in any of those buildings, regardless, they will get a voucher to position them in a, a better, a like or better situation. Correct. They're eligible for a voucher. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, let me just add one more piece to that, if I will. Um, because we're a federal agency and because it's federal funding, all the rules and regulations of the Uniform Relocation Act apply. Um, if you're familiar all with uh, transportation planning, highway development, the, U the uh, URA uh, was designed to assist people when relocation was necessary. So we, we are, so our relocation plan is going to be subject to um, the Uniform Relocation Act, and we'll be audited for that. Okay, thanks. I have one quick question. What is the, would be the turnaround, let's say, from grant approval to people moving back in roughly? Uh, depends on the phases. Um, let's just let's go to the Yeah. Yeah. Um, probably two and a half to three years. Okay. Okay, great. Any other comments? Or? Oh, thank you for your time. Um, I really appreciate the questions, um, particularly around the programming, because um, programming is so much more of a story that we have to tell. Uh, the land use and the technical components are one piece of it, but really what I think makes the community, besides design, is the programming and the commitment to that. So I really appreciate the programming questions. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Now we can close the public hearing. And we will bring it up here to the commission for discussion. Well, I think that um, just to begin with, um, what we're looking at is the is the concept development plan. And uh, according to what we have, the concept development plan identifies the layout, maximum intensity, phasing, and mitigation of a development. And the approval of the plan is followed by a series of detailed development plan applications demonstrating compliance with the code. Paraphrasing. Um, so there have been a lot of uh, questions tonight, questions of discussion about, um, like to see more detail here, um, uh, and you know, what are the impacts of, of one thing or another. So for, for me, the, the work that, um, that 
that this narrative represents um, is uh, a concept development plan. I think it's um, I, I think it's interesting um, uh, in, in terms of this concept that there are 13 adjustments that are being asked for in this. Um, and I think that a massive plan has been thought about for a long time or looked at in quite a bit of detail. You're not going to come up with the types of adjustments that, are, mm -hmm. that have been identified here. Mm -hmm. um, I know from uh, from my participation in the um, in the uh, um, in, in the public meetings that um, a, uh, there has been a lot of effort that has gone into uh, figuring out um, where the buffers need to be. How do we put eyes on the street? Um, how what makes this a sustainable? Um, a, a, a part of the neighborhood. How do we make this a component of Park Place neighborhood as opposed to uh, how it's perceived now as being a project? And so the whole process that uh, the Trell and the team of Champion, I think, have um, not only put together a concept plan and addressed a lot of uh, detailed issues and technical issues and planning issues, but they dealt with community issues as well. And so um, I, I like this plan, um, and um, I think that's all I want to say about it right now. Thank you. All right. Well, that, was, that was funny. I don't like so much because that summed it up really well. I mean, this is, I mean, I really wanted to poke at this, you know, what does it really feel like at the, at the end of the day? And that, for sure, uh, just hearing some of these ideas of, of, of really, um, Cooking in a much better spot for sure. So you know, I'm very supportive of this. It's always great um, when the neighborhood association is such an advocate of it. I mean, right there, that says a lot. The neighborhood association couldn't be strongly behind something like this. Um, and this is just one of those um, projects for me where you know we try and create win-win-win situations, and this one feels like there's a lot of win in a lot of different places. So. Um, I'm very much supportive of, of this application. I guess, uh, did a, you know, one of my biggest concerns was uh, displacement and how long that would take and, and actually to hear that, that, that we will get at least within the first phase or first couple phases um, out of if and when we get the grant. It's not going we're going to get it. Uh, we're going to get back at least as many uh, housing units within that first phase um, then we would have, we won't have to wait for a long time really to get folks back in there. And then what we're going to end up with ultimately is a much better, a much better uh, project and area I think that than, than we have currently. So I think this is a great plan as far as I can see. Great. Well, I, I would echo that, and I I also like to say I mean it's a it's an exceptional plan. I overall I mean, I've seen lots of plans in my time, and I think what this has done is really is to build a neighborhood from from where there while there is a, a neighborhood now this will certainly enhance that it will give many more amenities and i think you've defined many of them here um it, i know it's just a concept plan i know there's a long way to go and i'm not here to tell you what color housing you should have and what color paint I, I, that's not my goal but but from what i've seen the layout is great it, it makes it makes great sense i'm mean, really impressed with the houses facing the parks I'm really pleased to see that the, the police um, are, are are included um, for security there, and that they say that they're involved near the near the park area as well. Um, a lot of really positive things. I guess the most impressed thing, uh, impressed thing I've seen is we hear so often here, uh, and and especially in the north time, you hear people saying that the that the city doesn't listen. And that the the planning commission, the city commission, and we just we just make these decisions pell mell. The fact of the matter is, the the, the citizens made this decision, not just the neighborhood, but the people that live in the, in the community make this decision. So you know, I I uh, dare to have somebody come back to me and say this is not well defined, and this is not what the community wanted. So um, I was, I'm really impressed with this process. I think the county uh, has the authority did an excellent job here. Um, I think they have a good team, and, and overall, I think it's an excellent, exceptional plan, and, and I applaud you for doing so. Um, and I just want to also say you thank the staff. Um, we are lucky to have the staff we have, and I think you were lucky to have the staff you have. And you guys work together very well, and I'm very impressed with what I've seen. 
so overall, I'm very pleased with this and would like to move it forward. So, do I have a, a motion? And I believe we're motion. We're going to approve uh, uh, this for the city commission. No, no, this is us. Okay, very good. I like that. Uh, so I'll move to approve CP ten o two and WR ten o five. Both. Second. With conditions. With conditions. <laughs> this is it. Okay, we have a motion with the donor and a second by. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank fine. I'll call the vote. Thank you. Commissioner Powell? Aye. Commissioner Lazar? Aye. Commissioner Groner? Aye. Commissioner Sun? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming and, and giving us your input. And we appreciate it. And we uh, look to see this to be a, a wonderful opportunity for Oregon City. And the sooner the better. Thank you very much. Um, we will reset for about five minutes to clear and hurry for the next hearing. Uh, Thank you. Let's reconvene the Planning Commission uh, hearing this evening uh, for August 30th, 2010. Um, and uh, we are now going into our second hearing, which is PZ1001 and ZC1001. This is a uh, approval for a comprehensive plan amendment uh, from future FU, uh, FU, future urban to MUC, mixed use corridor, and a zone change from county FU10 to MUC1. And uh, at this time, thank you, uh, Chairman Powell, uh, uh, members of the commission. This is the time set for hearing of PZ 10 ZC 10 and um, there was a staff report prepared seven days before the hearing that lists the uh, criteria. If anybody would like me to read them, please let me know. Um, all uh, testimony, arguments, and evidence should be directed at uh, those criteria in the staff report or those other language regulations that, that you believe um, apply to the decision. Failure to raise an issue uh, accompanied by statements and evidence sufficient to afford the Planning Commission and any other party to respond to the issue will conclude an appeal on that issue to the Land Use Board of Appeals. And failure of the applicant to raise, conditional, to raise constitutional or other issues related to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the, the city to respond to those issues with the national damages in circuit court. Uh, with that, I'll ask for the planning commission members if there are any ex parte bias or conflict of interest issues that, that they'd like to disclose or discuss. I know of the site, and that's all. You got by it. And I know of the site, and I also participated in the related document, the Beaver Creek, Beaver Creek concept, and I know it well. Okay. And that's me. I None either. Challenges from many members of the audience. See none. Uh, That's all right. Let's Thank you very much, Council. Uh, move forward now to a staff report and uh, mm -hmm. that would be Good evening, Commissioners, and thank you, Chris Powell. Uh, the application before you is a comprehensive plan amendment uh, from the future urban to mixed use corridor with a zone change from County FU10 to MUC1, which is quarter one. The address is 19896, 19896 Beaver Creek Road, and it's County Map 32E 10C, tax lot 800. That's a parcel of land, it's about 9.6 acres. Applicant is uh, Merrill Wood LLC, uh, Phil Genderman, uh, represented by uh, Theta Engineering LLC, and uh, I'm going to briefly go through this PowerPoint, which is a uh, new exhibit um, that we're adding into the record. I've um, got an area photo here of the subject site. As you can see, it's uh, on the east side of Beaver Creek Road. Um, vacant land, I believe it's currently under far, uh, farm use tax deferral. Um, the uh, intersecting street that you see there is Myers Road, uh, right across from the high school, uh, just south of the high school parking lot. This is a existing comprehensive plan designations adjacent to the site. Uh, the uh, area east of Beaver Creek Road is FU, Future Urban. 
Um, and to the uh, west, you've got uh, the institutional site for the high school, and to the north of that is industrial comprehensive plan zoning. To the southwest and west is uh, medium density, high density, low density residential zoning, uh, comprehensive plan designations. This is a map of the actual zoning on the site right now. Uh, this, as you can see, the uh, school site is uh, zoned R8, and uh, you see the corresponding zoning designations there. Uh, it's 9.6 acres. Just a little background on the piece. Um, this piece of ground was brought into the urban growth boundary in 1979, um, and it had a uh, low density residential designation for some time. Um, and then the comprehensive plan was updated in 2004, received a uh, comprehensive plan designation of future urban. Uh, subsequent to that, um, during the Beaver Creek Road planning process, was involved in that. Um, and then there was an annexation that occurred for several properties, including this one, uh, including the Hall property. And it was annexed in with that uh, in 2008. Um, the metro design type, which is the uh, concept planning guidance document, if you will. Uh, um, but this, this site has an outer neighborhood design type that preceded the concept plan requirements. Uh, Parson was not subject to Metro Title 11 concept planning requirement due to the time of its uh, uh, UGB. It had been in a previous UGB expansion. Um, but it was part of the uh, part of the plan, and the area that it's in was planned as a mixed employment village in the Beaver Creek Road concept plan. Um, the status of the Beaver Creek Road concept plan is that it was appealed to Luba and subsequently has been remanded to the city of Metro following that appeal. So, as a basis for decision making, has not been used in this uh, planning in this. Uh, staff report. However, we had, did make uh, findings and concurrence as a separate append, uh, exhibit to the report. Uh, there are references to the Beaver Creek concept plan in our staff report to talk about how it's uh, planned in, adjacent, in relation to adjacent properties which have not been uh, uh, received zoning yet. So uh, what the applicant is proposing at this time is no development. They're proposing to get a zoning uh, of MEC1 on the property, uh, and uh, I'll go into that in more detail. The approval criteria for this are uh, found in the Oregon City Municipal Code 1768.020, and those include uh, finding compliance with the goals and policies of the comprehensive plan, um, adequacy of public facilities and services, uh, water, sewer, storm drainage, Transportation in particular, which I'll go into more detail, schools, police, and fire protection prior to issuance of a certificate of occupancy. Uh, the other criteria is that land uses be consistent with our transportation system plan. In this case, the zone change is required to show compliance with the transportation planning rule, which is an Oregon administrative rule. Um, 660-12060. We've also uh, made findings for compliance with statewide planning goals, uh, and we've also made findings for compliance with national titles one and seven to the extent that those are applicable. Title one is an employment um, uh, title, and title seven is an affordable housing title. Um, and I can go into more detail on that. With respect to the uh, transportation planning rule, um, I'll just briefly go into more detail. So for zone changes and comprehensive plan amendments, there must be substantial evidence in the record to either make a finding of no significant effect on the transportation system, or if there is a significant effect, assurance that the allowed land uses are consistent with the function, capacity, and performance standards of the transportation facility within the planning horizon, which in this case has been agreed to as year 2027 uh, through ODOT and the city and the applicant working together. The transportation analysis is based on an assumption of uses. 
since there's no development proposed, but those assumption of use is consistent with MEC1 zoning, consisting of the following. A shopping center of approximately 20,000 square feet, an office about office space totaling about 80,000 square feet, and townhome or condominium of 30, use, 30 units. Uh, net increase from these was calculated to be 173 new strips, and at ODOT request, the applicant conducts the analysis with the planned extension of Mother's Road between Highway 213 and Beaver Creek Road, and without that extension, since that is a critical component of transportation improvements necessary for there to be um, a, lim a minimized effect on the Highway 213 corridor, where there are already uh, failures occurring at intersections up and down the corridor between Malala Avenue and Myers Road. Um, ODOT determined that if the rezoning caused the volume capacity ratio to increase by more than point, a factor of 0 0.01, they would consider that to be a significant impact and thus require mitigation. And so for the Myers Road extension scenario, there were two locations at which this criteria, sorry, for the Myers Road, um, if Myers Road extension was not part, uh, was not built, there are two locations at which this criteria would be met. And so this was exacerbate the existing failure in two locations. That would be Highway 213 Malala and Highway 213 Myers Road. And for the scenario that assumes Myers Road is extended, the only intersection which potentially exceeded the 0.01 factor was the Highway 213 Myers Road. Um, if the city can make a written determination that certain improvements which would alleviate the situation are reasonably likely to be constructed by the planning horizon of 2027, I uh, would have the support of um, ODOT, um, and what ODOT considers to be reasonably likely improvements are ones that are either um, on ODOT's list of plan improvements or which are on the city's list of capital improvements and which have been designated on a capital improvement program and for which the city is collecting system development charges. Um, so uh, the city is already collecting system development charges uh, for two projects. Uh, one is for the state system 213. Uh, we collect 30% uh, uh, of the cost of that improvement uh, through our SDC program of the total cost of that improvement. I believe it's about a $50 million uh, highway extension project. I could be wrong on that, but um, I can check the numbers. The uh, second project is the Myers Road extension. What my road extension would do would connect the parcel in question um, through the existing east leg of Myers Road, where it runs by south of the high school from High School Avenue, across the uh, parcels in between that point, over the Platinum Community College campus, to connect with Myers Road, where Hagen is on 213, and. Um, so we collect um, NSDC for 100% of that cost as a city, city capital improvement program. And, uh, and it is in our, uh, it's part of our most recent transportation system development says plan study and is part of our existing program for what we are already collecting SDCs. Um, the other recommendation of the uh, ODOT and, and also which has been proposed by the applicant to alleviate um, and uh, uh, the situation would be the addition of a westbound right turn lane at, OR, at Oregon 213 and Myers Road, which would be on the community college, corner of the community college um, and at the time of the de of development. And if that is in place, it would bring the volume capacity ratio um, to within a reasonable range. Um, should note that the addition of a northbound through lane on Oregon 213 to complete a five lane section is being done incrementally, um, and that would also meet ODOT mobility standards with or without rezoning. But for the purposes of this zone change application, uh, we're looking at the proportional share 
and we're also looking at making, you know, we've, we've had the our transportation engineer look at the applicant's transportation planning analysis and uh, talk about the likelihood of the parcels developing within the time frame of the planning horizon by 2027. They do think it's very likely that the college's master plan will be realized. Uh, college uh, master plan has as a condition of approval of uh, phase two of its master plan um, construction of its portion of the Myers Road extension. Um, and their master plan, a planning horizon, I believe, was 2015. So in spite of the current economic conditions, which would cause a slowdown, um, uh, and they may be before you to extend the planning horizon uh, as well. But based on that, we could also consider that a reasonably likely um, approve, uh, improvement, at least on their portion. Um, so these are the recommended conditions of approval. I would like to go back to this slide here. Um, with respect to compliance with the goals and policies of the comprehensive plan, uh, if you draw your attention to page uh, 15 of the staff report, at the bottom of page 15, we have an uh, uh, urban growth boundary goal um, and policy 14.1.2 of that goal provides that concept plans that provide more detail than the city's comprehensive plan will be required prior to development of lands within the urban growth boundary. Um, now, the property was brought as the UGB prior to a concept planning requirement and was uh, added in 1979. Um, surrounding farmland and property was brought in in 2002 and 2004. Now, uh, Beaver Creek Road concept plan was approved by the city in 2008, and while the concept plan is the subject of a remand, um, to the city and Metro in order to reconcile certain findings regarding the doctor design type consistency. The uh, concept plan does provide a publicly shared vision for development of lands, including the subject property, within the urban growth boundary. Um, it's, we'd like the city commission to clearly understand that, you know, status of the concept plan is not final. It is under remand, and this parcel was included in that in that parcel. So you really can't have, you can't really have two um, concept plans on, running concurrently on the same property anyway, can you? Don't believe so. Um, you can't really have two concept plans running on the same property at the same time. Um, yeah. I mean, for instance, we know this is a new man. Yeah. They could be there forever. Yeah. But if you really want to look at, at, at a true concept of, of this development, and, and we determine that that's needed, can you run them concurrently, even though even though what is one is still existing, but is in remand? And there's a variety of different ways you, you might approach that. To, obviously, the biggest fear is that you have a concept plan on a small piece of something saying one thing, and a larger concept plan saying something different. And what do you do with the conflict? Would be the later adopted one will control of the earlier adopted one. So it's, there are ways to do it. Um, whether it makes sense to go through a full concept plan for a, a smaller piece like that, especially when you know that the concept plan is out there and that, um, you know, I, I'm trying to remember how much of an update they have um, given the planning commission on what happened on the remand, and that might be an appropriate thing to do as well. Maybe we could give you a little bit of history on when we. When the City Commission approved the Beaver Creek Road concept plan, and that was appealed to Luba, one of the issues was the difference in the amount of land designated employment industrial on the Metro 2040 map relative to the amount of land that actually ended up being zoned North Employment Campus available for industrial and employment uses um, on the approved Beaver Creek concept plan. And I think it's important to point out that the property in question was not brought into the UGB in 2002 or 2004. It was brought in much earlier. It was not brought in to meet employment needs, so it has never had the title, the Metro Title IV Employment Industrial Land designation assigned to this property. It's always been outer neighborhood on the Metro uh, design type map. 
so it was never included in the needs analysis for employment lands. Um, you may recall that at the last commission hearing, we were talking about the COO report from Metro concerning UGP expansion and the work that has been going on the last couple of years, and that he's come out with a recommendation for properties to, to look at for UGP expansion. Included in this update that Metro is doing are additional um, amendments and changes to things such as the functional plan and also the city is requested and working with Metro to amend the, the Metro Title IV map to reflect what was adopted by the Beaver Creek Road concept plan for employment lands to address the reason for remand from Luba to the city and Metro. So we are in the process of moving to have the concept plan that was approved by the commission um, comply with the reason for a remand and address the reason for a remand from Luba. So, you know, in terms of multiple, and I, and I guess when you're talking concept plan, do you mean um, a metro required concept plan, which this property is not required to do because of when it was brought in the UGB, versus our general concept plan for the our, I'm worried about our concept plan. In general, right. Design. So, you know, per our code, you know, it's, it's not required. Um, our, a general concept plan is required for publicly owned properties over 10 acres, um, and it's, a, it's an option for privately held properties at this time. So I don't, I'm not sure that it's, you know, we don't, we, the way our code is currently written, we don't have the ability to, to, to require that. Um, okay, so in, in a perfect world, and, and uh, Metro does and, and amends their maps and everything is fine and we look at it, I mean, we're instrumented back to the city commission for discussion and further action. The city commission at that point can can say, well, um, now that it, let's say this goes through, and now that we have this property that's changed zoning, um, how will that how will that affect that, and will that will that cause that that whole that whole planning process to be null and void, or is the one piece have to be redeveloped, and what will that cause down the line? That's what I'm worried about. So in the Beaver Creek Road concept plan, this area was designated as a central mixed employment village. So it's consistent with the requested zoning in terms of so that's the AC1, right? AC1, which would allow those types of uses. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so that's, I mean, that, that, that the uses are very, very similar. Mm -hmm. um, we did come up with new zoning designations. Yeah. The Beaver Creek concept line, some of them very similar to what we currently have. We didn't have a North Employment Campus, which this was not going to be. Um, so we did come up with unique zoning for the Beaver Creek Road concept plan to just help implement that vision. But they were, you know, the residential was very similar to our existing R2 multifamily, our R5, our R6, our R8, you know, those were the same. They were based on existing designations that we had. So, so it's a push, or is it, is there something different? Is there a gotcha in there somewhere? If, if we if this goes into this type of zoning, so there is there any gotcha on the on the Beaver Creek concept plan? Is there anything in there that would be a problem? Uh, um, I don't. Up the top I have no. Up for the permitted uses, no. There may be some additional conditional uses that mixed use corridor one could allow concerning you know. A box over 60,000 square feet or something like that, which wasn't envisioned in the Beaver Creek Road concept plan, but you're still within a conditional use permit process at that point. Yeah. Uh, okay. And, uh, you know, I, I think the only real difference would have been, I think, in the, in, sorry, I'm going a little bit off the top of my head, but was envisioned, and I think the market analysis even showed this was roughly, you're looking at a 40,000 square foot, probably the largest grocery type of store that could be supported in that area, whereas mixed use quarter one allows a footprint up to 60,000. So that would be your difference there. Mm -hmm. And permitted uses, other than that, they're very, very similar. Okay. Well, well I'll right. point out, in the applicant's description of uh, what, why they're requesting NUC1 zoning, they, they point out that NUC1 zoning is, in our purpose statement for NUC1, it talks about Beaver Creek Road as a corridor. I'm not sure if the intent of that purpose statement was to go as far south on Beaver Creek Road, but at the same time, the transportation system plan calls it out as a as a corridor, um, and so the types of type of corridor that it is would lend itself to that type of zoning. 
and that seems to be consistent with comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, so those are the findings that we've made um, in that regard. Okay. Uh, so um, based on the consistency of the comprehensive plan, the ability to serve the area with public facilities and transportation infrastructure, uh, which is in our capital improvement program, um, we are recommending uh, approval with conditions, um, and uh, the condition of approval for Highway 213 Myers would be um, that, I'll just read this into the record, um, based on demonstrated significant effect to the intersection at Highway 213 Myers Road, before receiving building permits, the applicant shall contribute a proportional share of funding for the construction of the west sound right turn lane at the Oregon 213 Myers Road intersection. The amount of the proportional share shall be determined based on a revised traffic impact analysis that will be submitted, submitted at the time of development application is submitted when the proposed uses are known. Um, so that was condition number four. Uh, conditions number one, two, and three are all uh, standard pieces of approval from the engineering department, which would also apply to future development applications. And so do you know the timing of the TSP on that Myers Road intersection is compared to what we're talking about here in the, in the planning horizon? Um, a portion on the community college uh, campus. I think the initial anticipation was that it would be in place by 2015. Um, when, we approved, when, we, when we approved the Clackman Community College Master Plan, <coughs> they have, for phase one, they're allowed up to 40,000 square foot, I believe off the top of my 40,000 square foot. Uh, 50,000 50, square foot of new um, building on the campus. Mm -hmm. Once they exceed that threshold, there were two transportation improvements identified. Their first, op their preferred option was to construct Myers Road across the southern part of their property um, and create an alternative access so that as you're coming northbound on 213, when you hit Myers, you could access the college uh, from that, that new southern entrance. The other option would be dual lefts and some intersection improvements at the existing um, Douglas Loop intersection with Malala 213. Um, so we've identified a threshold. We have a condition of approval on the college. Uh, once they hit that threshold, that improvement would be would be required unless they come in and amend their concept plan. Um, we've identified street improvements within the TSP. Uh, we've identified the costs. We've identified we've included those costs in the system development charges that we that we that we collect. That's about you know. Predicting when we're going to get that 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 complete connection across, what are you know the, 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 the park the park department has purchased one of the properties when that park piece redevelops, they'll be getting some of that Myers Road improvement. And I believe that leaves two tax lots in between Myers Road and the and the college property. Um, I I can't. You know, that, that's, that's the best that we can do, is to identify it, to identify the need, put it in our transportation plan, collect the FPCs on it, um, have conditions of approval on adjacent properties to make that improvement and make those dedications. Um, it's, it's certainly much, much more than not having it in any plan, not having conditions of approval that exist to go across existing properties um, to, to, to make sure that that improvement does occur. Well, that's that's my I can't help anymore. Okay, thank you. Interrupt again. Sorry. Bring up the map here. Look at I guess it's one one other thing. Um, we uh, Pete and I did receive an email from uh, Mr. Uber, the principal regional planner at Metro, this afternoon. And um, they did, he did request that this letter get that get put into the record, and that was my mistake for not having it printed off. But I'll go ahead and just read it in the letter. The record is pretty quick, and we've we've addressed this this issue with Metro staff, but uh, we'll just go ahead and clarify it right now. 
uh, stated stated today. Thank you for the opportunity for Metro to comment on the proposed uh, rezoning of the 9.59 acre property in the Beaver Creek Road concept plan area from future urban designated to mixed use corridor designation. The purpose of this letter is to request that you or Ms. Conkle let me know if the subject property is within the Metro Urban Growth Management Functional Plan Title IV, Common Industrial Employment Area, that has been slated for rezoning out of Title IV land. So the question for that, is, the answer to that is, we talked about this earlier, no. It, it was never designated Title IV. Uh, going on, if it is, please let me know why the city did not want to wait for the Title IV map change to be completed before the city proceeds with the zoning change. Include this letter in the city planning commission record on this matter. Thank you sincerely. So, um, it was never Title IV land, uh, so it, that addresses his question that he had, and we will follow up with Metro on it. All right, good. Thanks. And I do have one question that's before you leave it. In the staff report that's under comments, it says, uh, um, Number five, notice the proposed subdivision and details of the development were. Oh, we'll send out. Is that a typo? That is a typo. Thank okay. you for responding to that. Okay. Um, we proposed a zone change. Okay. Uh, That's what I thought as I was reading through because I just. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I uh, apologize for that. Uh, but it did go to Department of Land Conservation Development as well. So, um, and um, all of the affected agencies are normally notified when that's a zone change. Okay. Any other questions? That yeah, I got one, one quick question. <coughs> yeah, just about, uh, just curious about, we never saw anything about other stakeholders that were, that also participated in the Beaver Creek concept plan, and apparently they never had any, um, uh, they, they never had anything to say. Did, were they the notified the individually? No. Landowners? I mean, uh, you know, were they within 300 feet? 300 feet, yeah. And neighborhood associations. Okay. Uh, however, the original stakeholder groups from the Beaver Creek Road Concept Plan were not notified. Okay. Uh, we did our standard notice to affected agencies, so that clock missed. County, um, mm -hmm. the neighbor association, CFD yeah. posted the site, put it in the paper. But that said, had we, if we were to go ahead with this decision, it's congruent with, with what they came up with. At least that's what I mean. Yeah, that's that kind of my second point anyway. We never heard from them. I mean, from Rose or other people, we all stakeholders that have, have portions of land that are affected by this. And because this seems to be congruent with what we're doing anyway, we never got a comment. I, I'm just sort of sitting mm -hmm. along and saying, guys. I mean, they, they must not have an issue with this. I don't see not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? All right, Pete, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, this time we'll have the opportunity to come up for the presentation. Mm -hmm. I'll bet you have <laughs> Thanks for your patience. And we'll enter that letter from measure the record is Exhibit 1. Thank you. Good evening. I'm uh, Phil Gettleman. Um, and we're now on the number 20, uh, 2137 uh, Merrillwood Court in Westland. So the, uh, this is kind of thanks to staff for the amount of time they spent in doing the staff report. Because well, they submitted the uh, application was about this thick, and you know, they came, you know, when it came back to the staff report, it's, which we'll try and cover in 15 minutes. I'd like to introduce a um, uh, team. Uh, I've got uh, Bruce Goldstein, Goldstein with uh, Data Engineering, who's looked at utilities and services. Uh, Phil Worth from Kettleson Associates, that uh, did the traffic study. And Jeff Kleiman, the uh, land use attorney, who, who helped us preparing the application. Our application is to zone our property from Clackamas County FU10 to the Oregon City Zone, MUC1. The problem we've had is without the zoning, uh, we're now able really to proceed with financing uh, on the property or to partner with somebody to develop it. The first question we would get is do you have, you know, what's your zoning or entitlements? And when, when uh, we say we're not zoned at this point, we're zoned Clackamas County, if you can, they said, well, uh, we'll give you a call or give us a call when you've got some zoning. We've owned the property uh, for about four and a half years. Uh, the property was brought in, as, as uh, he said, in the Urban Growth Boundary in uh, 1979. And just shortly after purchasing the property is when the Beaver Creek 
conceptual plan uh, came up, so we were asked not to send an application for development or zoning that were annexation at that time. And then I served uh, for a year on the, the task force, um, meeting what, I think, what do you mean, once a month or every three weeks or whatever it was, and developed the big, big conceptual plan. And, and uh, our point plan is that the, the MUC1 zone um, that we're requesting is uh, compatible with or conforms to the Beaver Creek uh, conceptual plan we developed. When the uh, Beaver Creek conceptual plan was remanded back to the city, then I went sat, and so then we have to ask for and apply for annexation to the city. And, and normally, when we're annexed in, I've had other properties, when you're annexed in, you also are annexed in and you're zoned. And then this is just kind of special circ uh, circumstances. So now we've come back and are requesting to, to uh, have our have, you know, uh, property zone in UC1. You want to, um, uh, Pete, I mean, in Phil, I'll just sit here and okay. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Phil Worth with Kittleson and Associates. It's a pleasure to be back here. Um, I had a long dissertation I was ready to deliver, but uh, Mr. Kunkel and Mr. Walter did a great job of representing uh, the bulk of the work that we've gone through from a transportation perspective. So I'm going to be very brief. I, I think the key thing I'd add to everything that's already been said is <clears throat> there was quite a bit of coordination that we went through staff and the consultants with ODOT to try and um, quell their fears and make sure that things were addressed in a way that they felt comfortable with them. Uh, in large measure, the condition that we have here is really to keep them happy. Uh, practically speaking, between the TSP and the FCCs that are collected, uh, in all likelihood, this would have otherwise been dealt with, uh, that being the right turn lane on Myers at uh, 213. But now you've got it as a condition of approval and it rides with the property until development occurs. So I'm comfortable saying you'll have a system in place that works if and when this property develops. And with that, I'll be quiet. Okay. Great. Any questions, uh, Travis? Or any other? Is that? Okay. Okay, very good. Thank you. Any other comments for you? Okay. Very good. Well, <clears throat> Uh, seeing no one in the audience, uh, so I, any other comments, I, I would guess we didn't have anything in writing. So, um, we can close public hearing, I think, at this point. If we have any comments, which we'll do, and you don't need to rebut anything, so we'll come, I'll call. Uh, we did at the point have our neighborhood meeting in Yeah, so that you know, Yeah, we appreciate that effort on, on that. So, at this point, I'll close the public hearing and um, I'll back up the commission for discussion. Anyone would like to start that? Why not? <laughs> I don't have a whole lot. It looks like I have to. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I mean, I feel really. Uh, it, it, it's actually quite a. a Easy decision for me. I mean, this just seems to make sense, and um, and given that uh, where everything is, and with Luda and back, and where where that whole thing is, it just seems like this still makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, I would I would support this for sure. I I think it's the logical next step. Um, I I don't think it makes sense to wait for um, Luba and Metro and a remand process to hold these people up from doing what they need to do next. I think. Uh, um, you know, I, I support the, the applicant. I, I agree. I, I just was a little worried <clears throat> about the zoning. Uh, my my years have been late. I have no problem with that. And the traffic, I, I understand, and I'm I'm not concerned about buyers. I, I think that's uh, can come upon the city at, at some point. But um, we've got a plan in place, and I think it's on our TFP, and there's not much more to do as we struggle set. So overall, I'm, I support this as well. So, go yeah. ahead, just have to muck up the whole process, and we can certainly open the record again if the applicant would like to respond to this, but just so I understand, one of the concerns that I had is, you know, whether we 
commission votes to deny or, or approve this, um, when it goes in front of the commission, if it is approved, it would go in front of the commission automatically because this is just be a recommendation. And we do have one policy that talks about the lands east of Beaver Creek Road or Clackamas Community, Community College being um, needing a master plan done on them and that um, all those lands should be included. So, now, from what I'm hearing um, from this commission is that um, we believe we can move forward with this property based on it was in the UGB in 79. It's not required to go through the concept planning. Um, it does not have the Title IV industrial land, which is what we were doing the master plan for when we wrote that um, that policy. And so this is one where the commission is comfortable that that seems reasonable uh, for this application in this situation based on what the designation and, and land use of the property is moving forward. I just think that's important that the city commission understand that, you know, you're going back to policy 14.1. Yes, because really that's the one that I see. You know, we've addressed the transportation component, and I believe we, you know, we meet the comprehensive plan. That's the only one that kind of sticks out just a little bit. Where I just want to make sure you understand we have a comp plan policy that says this, and but we feel like in, in this situation it appears that it is reasonable to move forward that we are implementing that policy. Actually, Tony, it's uh, as you pointed this out. Policy 10.6.1 is just a Specific policies that you plan to use to the community yeah. uh, And I, I believe that I, I believe we've met that. I believe that there's a, a plan in place. I, it, it's in remand at this point. Mm -hmm. This this site is not changing significantly, and that was my concern. And uh, I, I I don't think I don't think we have any issue with that site now. That although I think this is. But to the later first, we will share that. I think we have an agreement from this body to sit down. Yeah, it's, just, it's, a, it's a policy question. You know, comp plan is pretty broad policies in there, and we need your direction assistance sometimes interpreting that. So sure. we'll certainly pass that along. Well, that's how we interpret it. So. Great. Okay, sir. Uh, looks like we need a. Uh, yeah. I'm going to come out with a motion. <laughs> I make a motion to recommend uh, approval to uh, the city uh, commission for approval as proposed by the applicant with conditions for their consideration at the September 15, 2010 hearing uh, for the application identifies planning files PZ 10-1 and ZC 10-01 for a comprehensive plan amendment from future urban designation to MUC mixed use corridor designation and a zone change from county FU10 to MUC1 mixed use corridor for the property uh, on Beaver Creek. Okay, we have a second, and this one is second. Um, Commissioner Stein? Aye. Commissioner Brunner? Aye. Commissioner Lidwell? Aye. Chair Hall? Aye. Motion passes, 4 0. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for your hard work. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ben Staff, for everything. Uh, anything totally for us? I'll just do this in quick. Um, I'm Spend first on Wednesday of this week. Um, I prepared a memo, and I believe you probably received the email with the link to the city commission agenda, where we'll be discussing under the chief operating officer's recommendation from Metro for UGB expansion potential lands to look at. There was a process in there where citizens could come to the commission um, and request that their lands uh, be considered for UGB expansion areas, so we did receive a, a request off of Davis Road, uh, just north and uh, a little bit east of the high school up there. It's about 20 acres. The hospital? I'm sorry. Yes, the hospital. So, it's in the Mill Creek Urban Reserve area. Uh, realistically, about eight acres of it is, is developable. The rest of it's either in the 100 year flood plain, natural resource overlay district, or steep slope area. Uh, the issue there is that if you bring that parcel in with the 20 acres, you pretty much create a, almost a UGB island. Um, mm -hmm. So you would pretty much need to bring in the, the Wayland property next to it, which is probably around 10 or 11 acres as well. Uh, so we've kind of we received those requests pretty late in the game. Um, we received them late Tuesday night. They were due to the commission on Wednesday, so we've been working on a little bit more uh, since this uh, since this uh, since those were submitted. So we've been making that presentation, um, and those requests are due to Metro by Friday, September third. 
Then we have till September 27th to submit public comment on the CO report, um, which, as I explained earlier, they are looking at Maple Lane as a potential residential uh, use the expansion area. Um, we, as I went through and looked at it, you know, we looked at we've seen quite a quite a slowdown in, in housing permit applications. Um, last two and a half years, last two years, we saw roughly 98 and 102 single-family residential permits issued. So far through August, we've issued 63, but that's on track for about 102. We keep that pace going through, uh, through 2010 here. Uh, the previous seven years, we averaged uh, 247. Um, so we've seen a pretty significant slowdown. We've also conservatively have about 350 platted lots in Oregon City uh, that have not been developed. If you include the approved land uses for the Cove, you have an additional 220 apartments and 180 condos. And then if you include in tonight's approval from the concept plan for uh, housing authority of an additional 200 additional units coming online, um, I think the SMS, when we started doing those metro, um, sort of looking at the trends over three and a half years ago, um, it's probably debatable whether uh, some of those assumptions on how quickly we will utilize lands is still accurate. Uh, that being said, we shot for, in the COO report, the middle third, which was roughly 28,000 to 104,000 uh, new housing units. Through efficiencies, Metro's identified additional capacity for around 34,000 additional housing units. So we've already hit the minimum of the 28 that they were looking at. So, you know, first you have the policy question of, do we think it's appropriate to expand the UGB in the region at this point based on the housing trends we're seeing and the fact that we're hitting the minimum uh, number that's been identified through additional efficiencies in the UGB throughout the region? Um, and the second question is, is it appropriate at Maple Lane to include that, um, considering the housing units that we have, the fact that we have Park Place concept plan approved and we've been unsuccessful in annexing any properties up there with Beaver Creek on the remand that we haven't finished the South End concept, and started the South End concept plan to date. Um, so we will be having those discussions on, on Wednesday night and uh, hopefully have some recommendations moving forward uh, at that point. Metro does hope to have a decision uh, by December of, uh, of this year. Um, I'd also like to announce, and hopefully you might see an email on this in the next day or two, I have a new building official started today, Mr. Tom Hosey from down in California. So very excited to finally have a building official back since guy's retirement at the end of June there. Very good. Yep. Okay, nice. Thank you. Other than that, Continues. All right, we're well, very good. Um, anything for the commission? Okay, well, this time there's nothing else. We are good for the season. Thank you very much.